Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to the seminar web webinar on the strategic role of IPv6, uh, organized together with uh, uh, LACNIC uh, in the name of uh, the Executive uh, Secretariat, uh, Oscar Leon. I'd like uh, to uh, greet you all and to wish you the best uh, success uh, in this seminar. And he apologizes for not being able to be able to be here. So starting this uh, webinar, first of all, let me start by thanking uh, LACNIC, um, Oscar Robles and all, everybody who made this webinar possible. It's such an important webinar for our region. So um, at uh, CTEL, we continue to uh, uh, promote the development of professional skills in the Americas for all our members, and this is one of them. Because uh, so, in um, under the uh, the framework of these activities, I am pleased uh, to announce uh, the I basic IPv6 uh, grant scholarship fifty. Uh, scholarships that uh, uh, LACNIC uh, very kindly offered, and we invite you all to participate. This morning, we're going to have a very important uh, um, opportunity to speak of the deployment of IPv6 in the Americas, the impact on the internet, and the strategic role that IPv6 is playing, and especially looking forward in the region. Once again, I'd like to thank LACNIC for all their coordination and the support for all the activities that we hold together with the uh, Secretary of CITEL. And uh, now I leave you with Mr. Oscar Robles, who will be with us this morning and will have the honor of listening to his opening words. So thank you and welcome to this webinar. Welcome, Oscar. Thank you, Maria Celeste. Thank you for welcoming us. I want to thank all of you who are with us today in this uh, webinar. We are aware that uh, there's a lot uh, of uh, supply of webinars, online courses. Uh, so we are very grateful that you devote uh, of your time to these uh, topics. So we are very happy to uh, uh, be able to have uh, this uh, uh, opportunity with OAS, uh, CITEL, uh, to, uh, uh, and especially we want to thank uh, Maria Celeste and of course Oscar Leon and for the uh, and the ITU also for the very positive uh, uh, influence in uh, creating these spaces. You'll see that throughout these uh, three sessions, two panels and a presentation, we'll try to present uh, different perspectives in such a way that you may have a, a clearer idea, uh, a better idea of the challenge that um, IPv6 is, but how strategic it has become in uh, the digital transformation processes in our countries and the uh, significance of having this aspect. 10 years ago, we could have thought that it was exclusively technical and uh, only up to the operators, but it's no longer like that. Now we have to involve a number of uh, players in the system. We have to work in partnership and we must deploy these technologies in the best way possible. So thank you again for coming and uh, we'll see you uh, throughout the webinar. I'll give a talk later on. And in the meantime, uh, we wish you a good uh, participation. Thank you, Oscar. Alejandro. Now we have the opportunity to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Lee Howard. Alejandro, can you introduce him? Yes, good morning. First of all, let me greet everyone. The next presentation comes uh, is going to be given by Lee Howard, that is a friend of uh, the House of the Internet, somebody who has collaborated with us in different uh, presentations on IPv6. And at present, he is acting se a senior president for global IPv4, and um, the presentation that he's going to give us today is called The Future of the Internet Goes Hand in Hand with IPv6. So, Lee, you have the floor. 
Thank you very much, Alejandro. <clears throat> my, my, I've given talks about IPv6 around the world uh, at, at every major network operators group, at regional internet registries, at lots of different kinds of venues. Uh, this may be one of the most august bodies that I've had the opportunity to speak to. Uh, I think that there's a lot that we, we all already know about, about IPv6. And I, it's always, it, it, with a talk like this, it's definitely a challenge to try to uh, say that I'm going to talk about the future, that I'm going to predict the future. So before, before I try to predict the future, I'd like to ask everyone to pause for a moment and, and think about the last 10 years of the internet and think about what has changed since 2010, 2011 on the internet that has changed how we use the internet or how you use the internet, because we, all, we do use it in different ways. So that might be the invention of the iPad. It might be uh, social media, how we, use, so how we use social media. It wasn't invented in the last 10 years, uh, but we've certainly been using it in different ways. Uh, maybe it's cloud storage, cloud, whether that's data storage or cloud networking or cloud web hosting or cloud applications. Uh, those, lots of these kinds of things are, have really significantly changed how the internet is used and in many ways, how the internet is built. We build things to enormous data centers now uh, that are shared spaces for, for cloud computing in different ways than we did 10 years ago, because 10 years ago, maybe uh, we had data centers certainly, but maybe companies would have their own uh, server rooms and their own uh, uh, servers in their, uh, in, in their systems. Uh, we've, we've become significantly more mobile in 10 years. And so uh, the speed increases that we've seen, 10 years is a really long time uh, in, in internet, uh, the, in the evolution of the internet, in, in technology evolution. And so it can change just radically in ways that uh, I think if we could, you know, th that are impossible to predict and we can at best extrapolate from where we are, but we can also say what kinds of things are possible or what could happen from where we are. And so that's kind of, if I look into my crystal ball, it's, I can say with pretty high degree of confidence that in less than 10 years from now, some advantage, some, some thing will only be available over IPv6. And I don't know whether that's going to be that there's some content that's only available over IPv6 or some, some new service or, or some new architecture or some new feature. There's something that's going to change how we use the internet that will only either, either only be available over IPv6 or will be much cheaper over IPv6 and, and significantly cheaper not just a little bit cheaper. And I can say that with, with a high degree of confidence because we can already see some of these things happening. We can already see that uh, IPv4 is becoming more expensive and IPv6 is becoming cheaper. And the problem is <clears throat> that the, just <laughs> giving away the, the, the whole strategy, the problem is that it, you can't turn on IPv6 immediately in order to be ready for whatever that advantage is, whatever that service or feature or content or functionality is, if you don't have IPv6, you won't be able to use it until you deploy IPv6, which may put you several years behind whoever else does have IPv6. So I, again, this is a, how do I know that this is within 10 years? Well, I can look, we can look at, I'm sure everyone has seen this particular chart before, but we can look at where IPv6 is. I've given lots of presentations called the future is IPv6, but I've stopped giving that presentation because, because the present is IPv6. More than a third of the world reaches Google and Google's properties over IPv6 already. And, and that's growing. I've only included the last few years here because it's changed. It used to be a much steeper curve, but what's happening now in the last few years is the largest networks in the world with very few exceptions have deployed IPv6. And so <clears throat> as every new network starts their IPv6 rollout, it has a smaller effect. And so now it's linear. And that linearity is both new networks rolling out IPv6 and just on networks that have rolled out IPv6, just old equipment being replaced. So maybe the network was ready, but the, the handset wasn't, or the home gateway wasn't ready, or the modem wasn't ready, or the some of the applications weren't. So as those things are being replaced, uh, we see a, a linear increase. It, in case you haven't 
really stared at this chart before, there's this really interesting up and down kind of fuzzy line. And that's because the uh, there's a big difference in whether people use IPv6 to reach Google, uh, whether they're at home or at work. At home or on their mobile device, mobile carriers have a much higher degree of IPv6 deployment worldwide. Uh, in, in many uh, countries, the mobile carriers have 98% of the time they're using IPv6. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty pervasive in, in a lot of places. Residential ISPs also grow uh, quickly and therefore have uh, more need for more IPv4 addresses and therefore they've deployed more IPv6 and often they have more control. But the enterprise, the business users tends not to have IPv6. And so when people reach Google from work, they don't have it. And so that's the difference between those, those daytime and evening or weekday and weekend numbers. And that's why it goes up and down like that. We know people often ask about how the pandemic has affected uh, IPv, well, for my business, IPv4 addressing prices, sales, and also of course, IPv6. And I think it's pretty clear that something happened in about the middle of 2020 where uh, people just weren't accessing the internet. They weren't accessing Google from work as much, right? So they were using IPv6 a whole lot more. So that number, so the bottom of, that, of the, the, the shaggy curve uh, was, was much higher. Apparently, as we've been returning to work, it's, uh, it's even that a little bit more. This linear growth means that if we're at 35% this year, we'll be at 40% next year, 45% after that, you do the math and it still looks like 100% in less than 10 years. And that's if nothing significantly changes. So this isn't just the dominance of a few networks or a few countries, not, not anymore. I'm gonna show you a qu few quick charts that again, I, I'm sure most of you have seen IPv6 in South America, uh, almost you know, more than a quarter, almost one third of users in South America reach Google over, uh, sorry, this is APNIC tests um, over IPv6. Uh, Central America, uh, more than a third. Uh, something strange happened uh, in the past week in the measurement in Mexico. And so it's suddenly, I'm not really worried about it. It's one of those weird things that sometimes happens when you're doing live measurements. Uh, something similar happened in Trinidad and Tobago uh, uh, recently also. And so similar down drop that I don't think is real. I think that once that's uh, corrected, it'll, it'll come back up. Uh, not as much IPv6 deployment in the Caribbean. And that's, um, it's hard. It's harder to get IPv6 there from what I understand. And I think that's because of the difference in the internet dynamics in, uh, in island countries. So for example, well, I wanna look at the, the motivation for a traditional telecom company to deploy IPv6 compared to a new company. So in a company that had, in a country <clears throat> where there's one major incumbent PTT, they have IP addresses. They have nearly enough IP addresses for all of the users that are going to connect to the internet through them. And they don't need connectivity peering with everybody else. When you have a 90% share of the market, then you're not especially motivated to provide great terms for access to, to other new companies. So if a new company is coming into the country or, or, or the market, it uh, doesn't even have to be an entire country. We have uh, lots of, of small ISPs serving small regions. A new ISP or a new mobile carrier, or, and this is especially interesting, I think, a new web host, doesn't have the same opportunities that the incumbent had. Yes, they have to build out the same infrastructure that the incumbent does. So they need fiber and they need servers and they need power. Uh, but they also need IPv4 addresses and they need connectivity. And so if, the, if they can't get IPv6 connectivity, then, uh, then they're going to be, uh, have to go buy those IPv4 addresses. They might also need network address translation. I can come back to that. Meaning there's a high cost to entry. So if it, if, so strategically and politically, if competition is important to drive down prices, to provide, to motivate companies to provide faster cheaper internet service, then there's a problem here. And I, I, I don't want to understand, I want to make sure that I've described just how large this problem is. My company 
sells IP addresses. We're a broker of IPv4 addresses. And in the past year, we have seen the price of addresses increase frighteningly. Uh, we published this information. So this is on our public website. So now instead of two years ago, IP addresses cost IPv4, you could buy IPv4 addresses or the right to use those addresses for about $20 an address. And now we're seeing IPv4 addresses selling for as much as $50 or $60 an address. And if that trend continues, it could be $70 or $80 just by the end of this year. Uh, we don't know where the top is. And it's a real problem because what obviously what we find here is that there is a lot of need, there's demand for IPv4 addresses. Programs that were put on hold in 2020 are being started up again. People are building out their networks, whether it's their access networks or their mobile networks or their, their websites, their, their server farms, their data centers. They're building out new systems and they have to have IPv4 addresses to make those things work. It doesn't almost, in many cases, doesn't matter how much it costs. At some point, there's a motivator that says, this is too much. In, in, in a lot of places, I worry significantly. If, if an address costs $60, but you can only charge $40 a year for mobile access, then I don't know how that company is gonna, is gonna start up. Uh, there's also, there is, a, just to be thorough, there is a growing leasing market. So possible now in, in many places for a company that has addresses and is not sure whether they're going to need them in five years, they may say, well, I don't wanna sell those addresses. I'm not going to return them to LACNIC or other RIR. I'm going to, I'll just let somebody else use them for a little while. And so maybe they'll make 50 cents a month per address or $6 a year, seven or $8 a year. And uh, so that price, that's six, seven, $8 US per year is, can be very attractive to a company that is only making 40 or 50 or $60 per year. But it's uh, at the end of five years, if those addresses get taken away, then they have nothing. And so they have to have a backup plan. So strategically, there's the, the, the incentive to have some way to not have to keep spending this money is, is critically important. Uh, there's also, I haven't, compared here, but the cloud providers, some of them, and, and, and web hosting companies, uh, some of them, even CDNs, some of them do charge for IPv4 addresses. So those numbers can be very different. I've seen as little as, I've seen numbers that are one half of a penny per hour up to 10 or $20 per address per month uh, for those kinds of services. And clearly these services are going to be uh, are, are uh, it, the providers have to pass on these costs in some way because otherwise they're not going to make any money. And there's really only two things that you can do to lower this, um, to, re to reduce these costs. You've got two choices. You can do address sharing, use one address per multiple users or IPv6 or both. And so let me look into those a little bit further. So carrier grade network address translation. Again, most people are probably, are probably familiar with this. So network address translation allows you to put many users behind one single address. So that's, that's really useful. Obviously, instead of if you put 10 users behind a $50 address, your cost per user is $5. If you put 1,000 users, then it's $0.05. Cents. It's, it, it helps a lot. But there are a couple of problems here. If you have a website or you have a a corporate network, and you're being attacked by, by this, you can see over on the left, there's a one, one wire is labeled bad guy. If that bad guy is attacking you, you're going to block that IP address. But that's going to affect the other 999 users that are coming from that IP address. So that's bad for all of them. Or if you are a police officer and you're trying to investigate a cyber crime from, or a, you know, an international agent, uh, coming from some IP address, but there's a thousand different ones there, you have no way of knowing which user is in there, which, which of those thousand users or hundred users or even 10 or 20 users. So 
I've looked at, I've done this a few times, uh, looking at the cost of, uh, the overall cost of this. So you, you lower your cost per address per user, right? Because if you've got 10 users sharing a $50 address, it's $5 per user, but you also have to pay for the hardware there. In, in the case of, uh, so, and that, that costs, my, my estimate for carrier grade is four or $5 uh, per user uh, to build out those systems. That's, uh, that may be retail price, but, and I've seen people use lower end equipment, or I've heard of people using lower end equipment that wouldn't necessarily be considered carrier grade, but it's still very expensive. Maybe you're at $10 per user instead of $50 per user, but the, the, avail the possibility of, of bringing new service to, to people uh, in a region is, is much more expensive. So what, but you still need IPv4, right? You, there's, there isn't enough internet that's only available over, over IPv6. So you have another choice. Here I have a diagram of a, a house with a home gateway in it that is connected to an ISP. And there may be electronics in that house, some of which only speak IPv4, some of which speak IPv4 or IPv6 or just IPv6. So if you have IPv6 to the house, then everything that's going to anything on the internet that uses IPv6 just works. Native IPv6 just works. Anything that still needs to use IPv4, whether it's because it's consumer electronics that still only speak IPv4, or it's a web server or another application server that's only available over IPv4, that can go through a translator. And that could be a, a NAT that is IPv4 to IPv4, or it could be a translator that is IPv6 to IPv4. And basically there's several, several different ways to do that. And um, some have really small benefits over others. <laughs> LACNIC has a lot of presentations and a lot of uh, uh, training on uh, those different kinds of technologies. They basically work as well or as badly uh, either way as, as IPv4 to IPv4 translation. So, so it helps. What this does though, is the more traffic that's using IPv6, the less has to use a translator. And that's true whether you're using IPv4 or IPv6 in the home. So if 50% of web traffic uses IPv6, you can buy half as many IPv4 addresses. You can spend half as much on network address translation. And in fact, there's a large mobile carrier in the US who famously was one of the early promoters of IPv6 in the US. And their original reason was they were looking at how much they were spending just on, this is even before they were having to buy addresses. They looked at how much they were spending just on those network address translator boxes, those NAT devices. And they found that by moving to IPv6, they could eliminate millions of dollars worth of cost there. So that's, that has been a huge saver uh, for them. There are, I, I don't want to forget that I'm trying to talk about strategic reasons that, that it, this is part of a strategy. By enabling IPv6 like this, it also means that whenever the new feature that, that or new advantage or new content is available that requires IPv6, it's already deployed and it's there. But another major reason is simply that IPv6 is faster. And I've seen this and I've measured this time and time again. Uh, I've got images here. This is again, data from AP NIC. The green areas are places where IPv6 is faster and the red areas are where IPv4 is faster. And the, the darker green or the darker red is the, the greater the difference. And this is measured in milliseconds. So it's round trip time. So the time it takes to get from, let's say a mobile phone to uh, a, a web server and back. That's the round trip time. And it's a significant difference. And I, I wrote a guest blog post for Aaron um, a couple of years ago, where I looked into why is it faster? And <clears throat> as best I can tell, and I think, it's, I think this is true, but I haven't been able to run a really scientific experiment on it. As best I can tell, it's because Android phones are, uh, don't require all apps to use IPv6 because Google says we can't require our application developers to use IPv6 the way that Apple can. So they uh, wrote some software that any application on the phone, any app 
that requires IPv4, it will get translated from IPv4 to IPv6 in the phone and then use IPv6 across the mobile carrier's network and then get translated back to IPv4 at the edge of the mobile network. Well, the translation in the network is, it's extremely fast. It's, it's, it's so fast, it's, it's nearly impossible to measure. But the translation in the phone is being done in software. And so those devices seem to have, seem to add just a little bit of latency of, of additional round trip time. I say a little bit, but 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds is a lot. 100 milliseconds is a tiny fraction of a second. But if you have to do 100 round trips in order to load a web page, then that's several seconds that it's taking you to load that web page. And so the entire internet performance is degraded. And there's a, it is really interesting, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but it's really interesting to go look at the differences in connectivity in the countries where one is significantly different than another. In particular, uh, some of the, the, the countries where IPv4 is significantly better tends to be that there's peering over IPv4 that doesn't also exist over IPv6. So it's a, uh, uh, so once you bring the networks, the IPv4 and IPv6 in line in terms of connectivity, they get either very close depending on the translation technology you're using or IPv6 performance much better. So, and again, I talk about that in my, why is IPv6 faster? All of that really is, I wanted to, to make sure that I've pointed out, I don't know exactly what's gonna happen in, in the next few years. I know that there are reasons, there are strategic reasons to deploy IPv6, but I don't know which one is going to be compelling in any given case. So greater speed, I just mentioned, I've also pointed out, not today, but I've pointed out in, in other occasions, Google actually uses performance measurements to rate how high to rate a website in their search results. So if you type uh, IPv4 into uh, Google's search engine, the websites that respond that, that are the faster websites will rank higher in that. And higher search ranking is worth a lot of money to many businesses. That alone is a commercially strategic advantage, right? Because you're if your business is based on the internet or web, then, uh, then that's really important. Obviously, if you can spend less on addresses and NAT, that's, uh, that's again, a commercially strategic advantage. And it may be that an ISP or a mobile carrier can spend less on those costs even before a lot of traffic would be offloaded to IPv6 because maybe the web content for a country has, hasn't moved to IPv6 yet. In many countries, there isn't a lot of web content over IPv6. And so they're just ready for when that does move. I will say that some of the, uh, many, many of the, the measurements that show uh, where there's the most IPv6 content, it tends to be where there's the most being hosted by Google. Uh, most websites that, are, that, that use Google or some of the other major sites uh, tend to be, uh, uh, since all of Google is using IPv6, it's, uh, those tend to have higher, uh, web, higher IPv6 rankings for content. Uh, also worth noting that several companies have already done this. Uh, Google and LinkedIn and Facebook have all said that essentially everything they do is internally is IPv6 and IPv6 only. They, they don't use IPv4 inside their networks or data centers pretty much at all. Uh, they only do IPv6 in translate, IPv4, they only do IPv4 in translation at the edge. And they're doing that because it makes things easier for them because they don't have to do lots of translation inside the data center. So that may include some better forensics that may include that they have more granular, better data about who's doing what or which services are being run where. It may also mean for forensics, that, that's also, I was talking about uh, police being able to do investigations. Performance diagnostic metrics, and there's a new uh, related proposal at the IETF that is using uh, information embedded in IPv6 packets to diagnose problems and, and including performance problems uh, inside a data center network. That's something you can't do with IPv4. You can run test packets, but they're not the same as 
your, the actual packets being moved. The container numbering is part of why I think Google and Facebook are using IPv6 internally is it allows them to connect processes to each other without having to do multiple layers of address translation inside their data center. I talked at some length about the, the increased competition that if new market entrants can use IPv6, then, they have, then it's easier for them to actually enter the market and compete. Segment routing v6, very technical uh, detail, but uh, potentially a whole new internet architecture internal it for inside a network that allows uh, a large network to do things like ELS only using native IPv6 and therefore having very fine control over how they move packets around their network. That can include easier routing security, easier routing policy and easier security policy. Anytime you have to write down a list of IP addresses, if you've been given small blocks of IPv4 addresses over time, <clears throat> that list can become very long and tedious. If you can architect that from the beginning, it becomes much easier and you actually miss less. And there are, so there are cases where uh, bad access lists based on IP addresses have caused security holes. When there's no NAT, geolocation works better because you're not geolocated to the location of the address uh, the, to where the, C, the, the NAT is, you're located to where the IP address looks like it's coming from. It's harder to do host scanning. It's harder to do denial of service attacks because every home has billions of addresses. You can't just uh, scan the entire uh, range of addresses. There are tricks to make it, that, that hackers use to make it a little bit easier, but it's much less practical uh, in, in those terms. And it's, uh, we, you know, so they move on to more sophisticated attacks. Privacy extensions is the ability to have multiple IPv6 addresses on a device and use and allow the, that address to change over time to make it harder to track so that there's better privacy for the, for the user, for their device. And then of course, there's the things that we haven't thought of yet. There's all kinds of innovation going on. There's lots of, there are lots of different things that can be done when you have 340 trillion, trillion, trillion addresses. People have used some of those addresses in their network architectures to say, to indicate the, the type of traffic or quality of service or uh, a data center destination or VLAN. And there's a lot of, there are a lot of ways to use that that can be very clever without wasting so many addresses that we run out again. And there's lots of things that uh, we're still working on. The, there's a set of extension headers built into the packets, built into the protocol, so that we can continue adding capabilities to IPv6 without having to <clears throat> completely rebuild the internet. So a whole list of things, any of these or something completely new may be the thing that changes how we use the internet in the next few years. And I don't know which one it is, but when I know that there are networks that have 98%, 99%, 100% of their devices are speaking IPv6, I, there's no reason for them not to start using those, the, those features for, for a competitive advantage. And whatever that advantage might be, and it may be different for different regions or different companies or different networks, whatever that might be, if you don't have IPv6, then you won't be able to take advantage of it. So I'm really interested to see we have a couple of um, uh, a, a couple of questions here. Um, I see that uh, Henri Godoy has, has asked that there was an increase almost double in the sale of IPv4 in the last report, 120,000 IPs. Uh, even though it's expensive, the purchase continues at an increasing pace. Does this show that the need for IPv6 that we've been talking about so much is not working? What have we got wrong? Is the high cost not being a tactic to force the increase of IPv6 deployment? Uh, I have not. So I have tried several times to look for a correlation between the number of IPv4 addresses being transferred and the rate of IPv6 deployment. And I have not seen that. I have not seen any correlation. Both of them look linear. Um, I haven't run that in the past few months, but, it's, but it looks to me like the price has not actually affected the, the rate of addresses being transferred. Um, which is especially interesting. You would think that 
prices doubling or tripling would change user behavior. But I think the problem is that if you have not already deployed IPv6, you have to, you, you don't have a choice. You have to pay whatever the seller wants because you have to have that. It's, it's sort of what happens in, you know, with, with inflation. If you're starving, it doesn't matter how much bread costs. <laughs> you have to have food. Uh, and that's, I, I think that's sort of what we're having here. And the only way to, the only way for, until IPv6 is a perfect substitution for IPv4, as economists would say, uh, it's the, the demand is inelastic, that people will keep buying those IPv4 addresses. It's uh, again, it's great for me as a broker, but it's, you know, it worries me a lot for, for the internet. Uh, are there other questions? Hola, Lee. Hola. Alejandro, por aquí. Hello. <laughs> bueno, are la, la pregunta en español. Eh, I'll ask in, in Spanish, right? We, we do have some more questions that we got from other sources. Let me give the first. We have three minutes, three questions. I think that it would be okay. Let me go with the first. What can a government, uh, what can a government do to promote IPv6? And as a matter of fact, this is a question that uh, when uh, you teach courses, when you travel, these are questions that I frequently get. What can a government do to promote IPv6? Oh, that's a great question. I, I've done a little bit of research on that. I have not updated my research recently. <clears throat> um, I, I've compared countries that have high IPv6 deployment, what did they do compared to governments that have low IPv6 deployment? The ones that have, that have a high deployment, uh, they have done things like require government websites and networks to use IPv6. That's in, in the, the US is, a, is one great example of that, where just because the government said we need IPv6 meant that their web hosts and their their network providers could no longer say there's no demand. They said we 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 will only we can only buy services that that support this, and so by creating that demand, at least that web host and that internet provider had to enable IPv6. With the next to come on IPv6, they could provide it, and so it, it removed some of the barrier by by pushing by pushing it first. Um, in places like uh, Belgium, which has a very high rate of IPv6 deployment, the government convened network operators and said, you must not use NAT because it prevents us from being able to catch criminals. And they said, well, we have to use NAT. And they said, the, the, agree, the, the consultation, the agreement they came to was, uh, if you deploy IPv6, then we will not take you to court for using NAT. But if you're not using IPv6, then uh, then you're not then it's it, it's it, it's your fault that we can't catch the criminals. Uh, so what hasn't worked really has been mandates. Um, China's IPv6 deployment is now growing, but their earliest mandates did not work very well. Uh, the U.S.'s even internal mandate, because it wasn't backed up by will, did not result in all of the U.S. government supporting IPv6. I think uh, Belarus had a mandate a few years ago and uh, their internet deployment has not shown significant changes. So requiring IPv6 of private industry doesn't help at all. Uh, requiring IPv6 of government agencies does seem to help and working in a public private partnership does seem to make a difference. Muchas gracias por, por esa respuesta, Lee, de verdad que... Se, se agradece. Tenemos dos preguntas más. Se encuentran en, en el Q&A, eh, si que tú la pudieses ver. Te, te voy a leer primero la, la que está en español, ya que tienes traducción. Eh, viene de Eric Miranda. E indica, ¿cómo apoya IPv6 a fortalecer la ciberseguridad de la empresa? I'm hoping for translation. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I know it's a little bit of how does IPv6, uh, I think it's uh, support or help uh, cybersecurity for, for businesses. And 
it, there's there's a little bit of of both ways. I've done uh, some presentations on IPv6 security and specifically for businesses. Uh, Aaron had a recent series of training uh, that actually that they uh, sponsored um, from a community grant, and and the answer is that uh, it can it can be helpful. A lot of business uh, network engineers will say it's less secure because I don't have NAT and NAT hides many users behind one IP address. But that's simply when you really dig into the, the technical details of how NAT usually works, it's just not true. And what you really need is a firewall and you need the sort of normal defense in depth kinds of measurements of security. There are some measures uh, for internal security, uh, secure neighbor discovery, uh, uh, RA guard, there's some tools that can be used to uh, to tighten up some of the internal security that make it harder uh, in harder to, to, to break in. Uh, there are also a couple of ways that uh, arguably uh, are, are potential exploits that you need to be careful. There's a, uh, you, you can't, for instance, block all ICMP v6, which is ping. It's a, it's a fundamental diagnostic, but you can't block all of that traffic because it's needed for some basic functionality in IPv6, path MTU discovery. Uh, what you can do is block specific messages that will help keep uh, users from, from exploiting or from even just doing reconnaissance on a network, trying to discover where hosts are on a network. So there are some best practices. I probably can't do all of them, but it's certainly something that if LACNIC doesn't already have that training, I'm sure we can find uh, somebody who will help facilitate specific details on that. Muchas gracias, Lee. Um... Thank you, Lee. There is one final question. There are more questions, but we have almost run out of time. So this means that your, quest, your presentation was great. This is a question in English by Roberto Lemaitre Picado, and the question is in English. And this is on NAT. I have heard NAT for IPv6 with IPv4 not so recommended. How true is this? So what, what people generally recommend not to do is to do IPv6 to IPv6 net. Um, there's, there's generally, and, and part of the reason, the, the biggest reason is almost, it, it, it's, uh, is that when you have native IPv6 and you don't change the IP address, then you have the packet stays the same from end to end, and it's, it's sort of architecturally more pure. If there's information embedded in the IP address, like I was talking about some of those, whether it's your VLAN or destination or what application, any information embedded in the IP address would be lost then. Uh, it may be, and we often find with NAT implementations that other headers also get changed uh, as the address gets changed, which can break other things. And that's potentially a problem. Uh, segment routing might, be, uh, might break if you're doing that. But, um, in, in most cases, it's, it's not really, it's not a, it, it, in most cases, it's not a problem uh, from a strictly technical perspective. There are definitely cases where it's a, it's, it's a major problem. There's one, one case where it might actually help, and that's when you have two exits, two different ways to get uh, out of your network and into the internet. Uh, no, changing the address to a unique address outside the firewall um, may help the return path use the same firewalls that you have uh, state information. Um, translating from IPv6 to IPv4 is, so there is a specific NAT64, which is, um, it's not a fantastic translation mechanism, but there are, but there, partly because it, it, it maintains a mapping and so it's a little bit slow. Um, there are other translation mechanisms that will let you translate from IPv6 to IPv4 and back like, 464xlat, MAPT, MAPE. Uh, there, there are a couple of other tunneling programs. Uh, those, those mechanisms work pretty well. And in fact, uh, my, my previous company, we were developing a system that was working on uh, building one of those translators into a single, uh, you know, small, a small server that could do 200 gigabits per second in, in one small server. I was pretty Pretty proud of that. It, it can be very fast if done well, uh, and and the, it's no worse than than IPv4 to IPv4. I think the advantage is 
that you can then have IPv6 only through much of your network. And so that, that can simplify a lot of troubleshooting inside the network. I'm sorry, we're Thank out of time. Yes, we have run out of time, Lee. I'm going to ask you one final favor, if possible, and please write your email address in the ah. chat in case someone might wish to contact you. Of course. I wish uh, we will invite you soon again. Um, Thank you. Cesar, te paso la palabra. You have the floor, Cesar. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, Lee Howard. So we will now continue with the first panel. Alejandro will be the moderator. Alejandro, could you please introduce each of the panelists? So let us introduce the panelists. Marcio, could you allow me to share my screen? And Lee, could you stop sharing your screen now? So we will now have a panel which has an interesting title, Digital Transformation and its Impact on the Internet Ecosystem. I'm pleased to say that we'll have four panelists who are experts I think this is a great opportunity to ask many questions, to clarify many doubts you might have. And first of all, let me briefly read the CV of Edwin Ricardo Estrada Hernandez. He currently works as the development director for the Central American region in the Val Night. He's a lawyer, a public notary, and has worked in the administration of the telecommunications market. He has a diploma and an environmental law. He is a consultant in telecommunications. Welcome, Edwin. Let me now introduce the second panelist, Carlos Martinez Cañazo, who is the manager of the technical area of LACNI. Carlos joined LACNIC in 2010 as the first member. He is part of the research and development group of LACNIC. He has participated in the deployment of IPv6 and RPKI. In 2013, he was appointed responsible for the internet security in LACNIC. And in 2014, he became the manager for this area. Many of you have met Carlos. He has been working in LACNIC and on various technologies. He has a lot of experience in the in ICANN. He has participated in many working groups. Let me now introduce Nicolas Antonello. He joined ICANN in March 2020. He's based in Montevideo, Uruguay. Nicolas coordinates uh, the regional part of ICANN and the strategic area. He is an engineer graduated from the University of Uruguay. And the fourth panelist is Victor Kalix, Kalix, sorry, who is in Guatemala. He works at Network Planning at UFINET. He has been working for many years, years in the communications areas related to ISPs, he has a degree in telematics and has obtained several certifications in the field. Welcome to all the panelists. And now I would like to give them a virtual round of applause to all of them. Now, before giving the floor to the members of the panel, and so you don't get bored, I would like to mention the concept of digital transformation. Why do I say this? According to the title of this panel, and to set the framework of this topic, 
and so that once again the title is the strategic role of ipv6 in digital transformation so i looked up the concept of digital transformation and in the same website i found these two concepts so we can pay attention to this and also the panelists so that you set your presentations in this framework. The first concept states that digital transformation is the application of digital capacities to processes, products, and assets to improve the efficiency, to improve the value for the client, to manage risk, and to discover new opportunities for generating income. The second concept of digital transformation is the integration of digital technology into all the areas of a company, changing mainly the way in which it operates and provides value to its clients. Now, having said this, I don't want to tire you further. I now give the floor to the panelists. So who would like to start? Nico Antoniello? Thank you, Alejandro. Good morning, uh, good afternoon here in Uruguay. We are earliest of all in the region. So good morning to everyone. I had to start. OK, thank you, Alejandro. I will be speaking about the two concepts or definitions of digital transformation and relate, we'll be relating this to the topics that involve ICANN as an organization and also with issues related to IPv6. I will start speaking about the domain name system, the DNS, which is one of the systems or the functionalities or the services that normally are considered a critical service. We describe these as criti a critical service because of the functionality they provide and the degree of use they have. The domain name system, as you are aware, is a functionality or the system that allows basically to translate a domain name to an IP address. When we wish to access any service in the internet, we normally don't know the IP address of the device, which we'll be connecting to ultimately, and we're not interested in that. So what we use is a name associated to that device. So the web address of a service to access, for example, public information or a financial service or any kind of service. So based on that address, before accessing that service, this is quite transparent for all users. What occurs is that the device which I'm using to operate does a query to the domain name, and it asks the domain name, I need the IP address associated to this name. The DNS system then returns a, this IP address if the association exists. And based on that IP address, then the connection is established or the data exchange is established in order to access that service, which is what the end user is interested in. Now, because always or almost always we access an internet service, this is first done through an IP address. This goes back to the domaining system, which makes it quite by critical regarding its function. You say the DNS stops working. Does internet stop working? No, internet will continue working if DNS does not work. Now the problem is, is that the translation of names to that address will not work. So the question would change. Who can recall the IP address of the services to which you normally access? And my answer is, at least my answer is, I don't remember any IP address. So this is, brings us back to the services that are un unable to be used. So the DNS service has that criticality. Another important aspect is that domain name system is not a service that is 
demanding in terms of traffic. It's not like a video service just to mention the other extreme, which would be video, which evidently is what the highest bandwidth requires and is most demanding in terms of traffic. DNS is not very demanding in traffic. The information that is exchanged is relatively very small as compared to any other service. However, the thing is the time, the mean time between failures or that uh, the system may be resilient uh, and that should always be available vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the uh, foreseeable problems. During the pandemic, during this uh, year and a half or two years almost, what happened at the beginning of the pandemic was one of those unpredictable events. That is, nobody or almost nobody uh, had uh, foreseen in their economic equations or strategic equations, had, nobody had foreseen that something as sizable as uh, the pandemic would happen. At least that's not something that uh, um, is considered regularly by the organizations uh, because it's something very unlikely to happen. So the cost benefit of having all the systems prepared for that uh, possibility is it's too expensive with a very um, uh, small yield. So we are not prepared for that. So what happened with the internet? What happened with uh, the domains, uh, DNS, uh, or the uh, services and protocols working operating there? What happened was that basically, let, starting by the end, nothing strange happened. Nothing catastrophic, another apoca nothing apocalyptic. Everybody continued to work to a lesser or greater extent as had been predicted. Now, what this, uh, what the pandemic was good for was to show that the design today of a network that has many networks as the internet is a very resilient design. It is, it tolerates a lot. Fortunately, it tolerates uh, failures or unforeseen uh, possibilities such as the pandemic or anybody coming in the future. Does this mean that it can't, ha it has no flaws? No, it's not flaws. And, and, and when I said fortunately, it's not fortunately, it's resilient thanks to the work of all the uh, stakeholders, everybody operating uh, all the networks regardless of their size. And regardless of the size you operate, the work that you do, the care, your care in following good practices and protocols in being technologically updated and having updated uh, systems and protected all that work that you all do at your scale that is what contributes to the overall resilience of the system so in the in systems we always say the it says that um, well the the chain uh, fails because of the smallest uh, link. So even if uh, you have a very, so if you are a very large organization and you can adopt all the measures necessary to contemplate uh, the, uh, possibilities, well, there are organizations that don't have so many resources and uh, that have to choose where they where to invest where to emphasize their efforts to ensure resilience and security. So in a nutshell, in the internet was resilient and resilient and continues to be resilient thanks to all that that I mentioned. The DNS is a critical system for the operation of the internet, but it's also resilient. There are several characteristics that the system has later on we can talk about some of them that make it very resilient and uh, uh, failure tolerant and as to ipv6 the system the domain systems the dns most that offer um this service the um uh, name 
uh, resolution uh, service has two types of devices, those that store information, that have the information of a name uh, associated, and uh, those that look for the information. Uh, we have the resolvers or uh, the recursive um, service and the authoritative that uh, service that have the information. So when a, a user needs a translation, asks a, a recursive a resolver to get that information. So they, it seeks out uh, the information and gets the results, uh, asking several authoritative um, uh, service. So, and most operators today have their services available and accessible both using IPv4 or the IPv6 protocol. So from that point of view, the DNS is quite prepared. Still, there's still a lot of work to do in that respect because there are still some, not a significant number, but there are several that do not have completely uh, have not completely deployed IPv6 in uh, their uh, name resolution services. Uh, so the invitation is to all make this service available both in IPv6 and IPv4, both for recursive and authoritative uh, service. So I'll leave it at that. Alejandro, maybe we can uh, move along, move ahead with some of the aspects. Thank you, Nicolas. Um, thank you. Um, and well, I have some news to the panelists. And we already started receiving some comments in the Q&A session. So we are fortunate because we have, the audience is paying close attention. So please feel free to make questions. There are no bad questions. The idea is to talk. So. Uh, we, we let's do it informal so that we may have a fluent panel. Now I'm going to give the floor to Victor Kalis. Victor, are you there? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, would you like to add anything? Okay. This will be well, to answer the question or? Okay, let's let's go ahead. Did, did you read the questions? Yes, uh, by Antonio Cueva. Could, could you read it, please? Because we, ha we have translation. Uh, Antonio Cueva says, I think that the concept of digital transformation goes beyond the use of digital technological capacities. It starts with the change of the mindset of all the organizations, starting from the C level and from there to each of the members in the organization. Obviously, the intensive use of technology is real, but in itself, it's only a part of this uh, great cultural transformation that is part uh, that uh, starts from the strategy to where the processes for all that everything client-centered. Well, I think that I, I agree with him. The digital transformation part, if we change, if we don't change the way we do things, obviously it won't happen. Let me tell you of our experience. Uh, in digital transformation, I think that it was accelerated because of the pandemic. But, well, not, I we believe it's 100%. Um, we started, um, we are a, a provider of providers. And when this pandemic started, we, nobody knew how far it could go. So we had to, uh, plan things because I think that all the companies have worked in some uh, project uh, for disaster management, for instance, having remote operations. In most cases, we believe that, uh, well, um, if I have operations in a country A and I can operate from country B, now what happened during the pandemic? It was not just the operations in country A that was affected, it was A, B, and C. So, from our company, we were already prepared to be able to operate despite disasters. So our data centers and the network, everything was ready 
to operate remotely from other countries. We also had to foresee that the situation would not have a negative impact just on one area. So we had to expand to implement a change that is preparing our operations area so that they could work uh, remotely and whenever possible as we are providers we also have to deploy uh, staff and we had uh, to meet all uh, the regulations and uh, uh, and the provisions by governments because of the health uh, problem and i imagine that if it was a challenge for us and we were quite prepared, obviously for other institutions, especially the, the companies, it must have been a more significant challenge because overnight, uh, uh, get um, to switching to remote operations, it we we had problems. So I imagine that other companies may have had much more problems. So what did we see in? the uh, traffic let me give you the context context we we do not uh, provide services to uh, homes uh, but uh, to providers and especially our traffic is not too focused on the internet traffic that is it's not most of our service however this started to change we now the internet traffic has changed because what happened in uh, the world in the offices in the countries everybody was leaving the offices and would stay home so what happened in the offices well they they were expected to have internet connection but some of them needed improvement so uh, I think that the general center and the bandwidth that increased uh, during the pandemic was 30 to 40 percent. And in our case, then we had to duplicate the bandwidth and the number of services um, and the services uh, for that is we multiplied it. Now there are three or four Internet services uh, um, where there used to be one. So that changed change make made us focus more on the experience of our users in the internet so we started initially at an operational level we translated our operations so that everything could be done remotely and then at a network level to expand our own network and also to start working on the quality of services because obviously it's not just uh, well we also that uh, uh, traffic flows changed. It's and uh, so when in the past there was something irrelevant, for instance, a traffic from a Zoom or a WebEx or a Team, even though they existed, then there was not so much traffic. But we run into situations where the countries were already uh, taking people to court because of those services and uh, the. The structure was not optimized for Central America because it's in, for Latin America, he corrects, because very often we found that these services are installed in North America and there are no optimal routes for countries for the uh, South America, such as in Paraguay or Argentina or Chile. So we had to start working the analysis on the analysis of traffic flows to be able to provide optimal um, uh, services to our users during the pandemic. So what did we start finding? We, we've, as, as I said, we are, are a carrier's carrier. We cannot get to homes. I can't go to the end user and implement IPv6. And so I just um, uh, give uh, uh, the, the services to the carrier that provides to the client. But now, now there are uh, uh, problems um, that are typical of IPv6 including the fact that there are IP blocks are or the uh, carrier's capability as they are not using IPv6. Well, 
que al mismo tiempo son personas trabajando desde sus hogares, lo, por lo cual se vuelve un tráfico crítico. Uh, remaining remote and many more cases, although we did have work, but this was done remotely. We never thought that this would reach the volumes that we reached. And just to set the context, the pandemic brought a lot of work as a result of the implications it implied, and all this work was done remotely. So there was a change in the paradigm. Why don't people continue working remotely? Well, they don't do so because they won't be efficient, but this is a, something that we contradict because the services and all the rest of the, of the things we provided remotely and it worked perfectly well. And this is not something temporary. It doesn't mean that once the pandemic is over and everyone will return to the offices. So if we have loss of performance, as was explained in the previous presentation, because of the use of IPv4, the only solution is to migrate to IPv6. Although I cannot help an end user and assist them with this migration, the support I can provide to our carriers is to start to promote this migration to IPv6 to enhance the network efficiency and in my network to provide all the optimization mechanisms for improving the traffic flows. For example, video conferencing has become so important now, as well as all the security mechanism. We practically migrated everything. I think that we won't go back to the previous situation prior to the pandemic. Not, we won't go back to our offices. I think many things are here to stay. And looking at the traffic flows we have, this is quite clear. Thank you, Victor. I'm very pleased that you did a recap as how Ufinet witnessed this, this during the pandemic. I would have loved to be have been in your shoes and to have experienced those changes and those adaptations regarding bandwidth and requesting extensions. It must have been stressing, but it must have been most interesting. Yes, it was quite amazing. We increased our automation capacity. And for example, in terms of bandwidth, this is amazing. This was increased four times, fourfold. There are bad things about the pandemic, but this was quite positive. I will now give the floor to Edwin Estrada, but very briefly, I'd like to read the description of this panel in the website so that we really focus on this. In some countries, including those of Latin America, social distancing and confinement measures were implemented to try to prevent the spread of COVID-19. These measures drove to an increase in internet use utilization rates, which resulted in an estimated growth in internet traffic of about 30 to 40 percent. This panel will seek to identify the role of each of the internet's critical elements in its operation during the pandemic. Hello, greetings from Costa Rica. A esta interesante actividad I'd like to thank LACNIC and CITEL for this invitation. So in that context, which you has just provided, it is a ple pleasure for me to share the experiences we have had in my role of Deputy Minister of Communications at the beginning of the pandemic. Costa Rica is no different from the rest of Latin America. We are forced to remain at home and carry out daily activities from the home. And this led to a change in the user's behavior. We were forced to tear down paradigms. So we saw how a more intensive use was made of the fixed networks compared to the mobile networks. In the case of Costa Rica, in 
we saw an increase, a significant increase regarding the penetration of fixed networks. Now, having to stay at home, we started to use the fixed networks we had because the mobile networks weren't able to respond to the needs we had at that time. This, in addition to the fact that we are staying at home, we are not alone at home. With us were our families, our partners, our children. So the demand for services, the demand for quality increased from the uh, the needs from the home increase so this was a transition that was taking place naturally for services regarding the icts had to be done all of a sudden and this is was what happened this is no different from many of the things that were described by other speakers in the initial weeks of the pandemic in march 2020 and because of the large number of people who are working remotely, students, people who are practicing social distancing, there was an increase in the use of fixed and also of mobile networks. We saw how in Costa Rica, the growth of the mobile networks increased 20% every week. And we saw how actions were taken in order to make the networks have the capacity to respond to this situation. It is quite true that the mobile networks did increase, but also the fixed networks because of that users, uh, the users activities, the use increased 50% in the peaks during the day. And normal services were maintained thanks to the efforts made by the telecommunications providers. Now, there has to be a cooperation and joint work with the Deputy Min Ministry of Telecommunications and the Superintendency of Telecommunications. This is the regulator and the competent authority in this field. A situation which also occurred and also happened in many countries was a moderate increase in the hired capacity. This is regarding the fiber optic international communications wires. So as a deputy minister of telecommunications, we first spoke about this and one of the main elements to be successful at that time, at that time of crisis, was to create a high level task force during that emergency. And this is maintained uh, to date. The role was to monitor, to respond, and to ensure the continuity of the services regarding the existing demand and the usage patterns. So some of the measures that were taken at that time included the following, the providers of the largest amount of traffic. In Costa Rica, we have three. The state operator was not connected to the IXP. However, we managed to make it connect for once and for all to the IXP in order to reduce international traffic and to maintain communications. And with that, in addition to the emergency that we were having, the information and the traffic didn't have to leave the country. So in that case, there was a greater autonomy in terms of content and also enhanced communications. The companies set the goal of acquiring more international bandwidth, strengthening the network infrastructure, and at the same time, additional measures were established to support users in this sense. And also, in the case of each operators, we had the following situation. 
we have some very creative examples of decisions made without uh, technical uh, support were not so good and had to be drawn back because many decisions that were being made were not the most adequate ones. And we saw how these affected the services. One of these measures taken in some countries involved in not charging the users and other measures that did not evolve. But in the case of Costa Rica, the operators on their own account made decisions such as providing preferential rates for a limited time. They also carried out negotiations for prepayment and also other benefits provided to users, increasing capacity, increasing the number of people assisting in technical support. And because of many people were in their homes and no longer in the offices, those offices that had internet services and had an IT team, now in the home, we didn't have these handy. So first, we communicated with the telecommunications, telecommunications provider. So there was an increase in the amount of personnel providing support. Another interesting thing that happened was that we witnessed many of the decisions made by the state. In Costa Rica, an exception was made for people who circulated in the streets, telecommunications, uh, technical support were allowed to go to the homes to provide technical support and troubleshooting. So the proper functioning of the red was one of the secrets in order to maintain not only collective maintenance work, but also preventive maintenance activities so that we can avoid damage to the networks and problems that might arise in regarding access. The telecommunications superintendency, the regulating agency, together with the operators, worked together and we conducted a weekly analysis of the performance of the network. And this served as an input for decision making in the different relevant areas. Decisions to be made by the state, to be made by the regulators or even by the companies. Another important thing to take into account is has to do with maintenance and ensuring users issues related to service. As users, we have an important task. That is why the state creates measures to raise the awareness of the users on how to make a more efficient use of the network. Some of the examples that we gave was teach how to download only those files that are necessary, don't download very big files, manage the use of massive emails, and optimize the use of all these tools. So we provided advice to the users so that they can make a more efficient use of these services. So it is also important because the pandemic has is not over. The issue of remote working, working from the home is here to stay. So I think it, this is important. We should bear in mind which are the actions that we wish to continue carrying out. 
promover el despliegue de fibra óptica, ¿verdad? En virtud de, de ese cambio de comportamiento de, del usuario que en el cual eh, nosotros... So because of that change, uh, now in the past um, we had a mobile and that was the way we communicated and we had the networks at our, our homes, maybe at uh, speeds that were not so high because of the usage that we gave uh, to those uh, networks uh, before the pandemic. And on the other hand, we had the networks at home, uh, at, at work. So I think that it is necessary to take uh, the fiber optic uh, to strengthen the uh, land networks. It, it, it had already started, but now it has accelerated. So I repeat that we need uh, to deploy the fiber optics uh, And the same thing for the digitalization uh, that, uh, and this is a, a call for the, the lawmakers and decision makers, because definitely we had to uh, uh, run, move away from uh, populistic measures that uh, have no scientific grounds in the uh, market of telecommunications. And we need to continue to work in the uptake of IPv6. Now we discussed uh, some of the measures that are proposed by governments. And in the case of Costa Rica, uh, we're also in the same line. And by the government to establish deadlines so that the public agencies may adopt uh, IPv6 and uh, so as to manage that uh, spillover effect uh, so that uh, the private uh, will follow. And the same thing with uh, our training people to make uh, that transition from IPv4 to IPv6. PV6 more um, uh, to stream uh, streamline it. So these are some of the experiences that I wanted to share with you from the, the, the hat that I used to wear at the government, but I think that can be of use to all of you. Thank you. That was very good, Edwin. Thank you. Thank you for the recap. You. Uh, several of your ideas were quite in line with Victor's, that is uh, that teleworking is here to stay. Now I'm going to give the floor to Carlos Martinez at LACNIC. Carlos, you have a floor. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. I also want to thank all the members of the panel that uh, uh, talked, uh, that already uh, spoke. I think that they discussed very well The, I think that there's very little for me to say. So I, I agree with what everybody said. I just wanted to mention a couple of internet infrastructure components that played a key role for the internet to work as we assume that it should, that is resisting unexpected uh, facts. Although this is something that we had read since we started studying that that was the origin of the internet, that it had, it was designed to auto repair and to scale up. I don't know to what extent in all the history of the internet in its 50 years, when in the past this has been tested. I think that what happened in early 2020 was a unique event uh, in history. So going back in time. I think that in April, May last year, I participated in some panels where some voices were raised warning about a potential collapse of the internet. As a matter of fact, they talked about a collapse, a crash. And at that time, we tried to reassure people, uh, stating that we didn't see that um, If uh, we safeguard some things, we didn't think that that would happen. And among the things that had to be safeguarded, for instance, if there is a, a fiber uh, interruption, then then the, te the technicians had to uh, go be able to go to the streets or not to cut the supply chains, um, because in some countries they felt that uh, their society requested them to have a very strong lockdown and uh, border closures. And But it was a problem if a supply chain could be lost. That is, if, I, um, if a switch is broken, I should be able to uh, 
uh, impulse want to replace it. The good news after a year and a half is that except for some very specific problems, it never happened in Uruguay. Uh, at LACNIC, we did notice an extension. That sometimes it took longer. We estimated, for instance, that importing a significant equipment would take 30, 30, uh, 35, 40 days, and now it's close to 60. But if you, if you know it, you can live with it. So uh, as a matter of fact, it didn't uh, cause any significant problems. Now, in that in same line, I think that we saw the importance of some elements of the infrastructure, the internet, uh, such as the traffic exchange and the uh, content networks. I think um, uh, country, uh, I think that in 2020 and 2021, those were key elements that enabled the scale up of the internet. And those of you who are not familiar, an ex um, exchange point is a switch. Imagine it as a switch. It's a place where a number of service providers agree they interconnect and they exchange traffic locally, not having to pay for transit, for bandwidth to the rest of the internet. And that has two essential virtues. One of them is not paying for transit because sometimes the cost of transit, especially for the smallest ISPs, may be significant. And the other is a reduction of the latency that is being able to provide services closer to the user with a briefer latency and better quality. And this is achieved through introducing the second thing, that is the content distribution networks, that uh, the, they are across the internet. And it's thanks to them that we can use things as videos, movies, uh, YouTube, Netflix, or all those services with excellent quality and with uh, service, uh, it's it's just like watching the traditional TV. So the best place to install is in the exchange points or in the large ISPs. But where there are none, or where there are many small ISPs, that uh, our traffic exchange point uh, gives a, a place uh, where they can be close to the users. To uh, that is to bring the contents closer to users. That is a good. Uh, feedback, uh, positive feedback, and it showed its worth um, in all uh, 2020. Now, there is, there were reports, and even not just in the region, but in Europe, that uh, there were some problems uh, with connections. It is true, but uh, we sometimes forget the in that the internet as a whole, uh, and we just focus on problems, local problems. Indeed, there may be local problems in a certain neighborhood or a sec certain building. There may be a saturation problem. And one of the things that is becomes evident, and it's very curious because it's an essential part of the perception of the quality of service, but it's ignored by many, is that most problems in the quality of service perceived by the user is in the user's own Wi-Fi service. It's funny, but today, that is one of the greatest uh, uh, causes, uh, causes of claims. So we have to help users to make their Wi-Fi work right. And of course, they need to maintain, as Victor very wisely said, we have to keep a chain of, so that their backbones may work or properly. Now, where do I think, uh, what is the role of IPv6 in uh, all this uh, uh, system? Well, IPv6, sometimes it's difficult to explain how it, it returns the internet as it was 20 years ago. That is, we, that we don't use so many intermediate boxes to provide services. So as Lee said, if I want to start a company, well, not necessarily a new company, an existing company wants to open services in a country where they didn't use to be, they have no IPv4. So my options are to buy IPv4. We saw what's happening. To use 
some translation. I'm actually, I'm going to have to do two, uh, two things to see what IP before I can get, what I can buy, and how I'm going to share it among many, many users. And that has a negative impact on uh, the quality of service as perceived by the users, but especially it has a negative impact because I have to introduce infrastructure pieces that are actually not necessary. I might do without them. So if I am afraid of having a supply chain that can be uh, discontinued or I won't be able to replace things or I have to, I have to wait too long. So introduction, uh, I think that uh, it's, it's, it's good, as Lee said in his presentation, that today there's a lot of content in the Internet that is not available in IPv4. I can't say, well, I won't do IPv4, only IPv6. And Lee also mentioned, and I listened to him and I, um, attentively, it is that that demon that I have to live with, don't make it so significant that will make life difficult for me. That is all the traffic that I will make uh, go through the CGN, not to not to have all the traffic and 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 to reduce that part uh, as time. We have measured the statistics. If in a network of users that don't know, if you don't tell them that you're going to implement IPv6 and you enable IPv6, the question is how much will that universe of users work with IPv6. And the estimations range from 35 to 50 and even 60%, depending on the on uh, the amount of videos that they uh, consume. So notice that not in uh, uh, the, the, the way you have to estimate the carry gray net is half as you. So there you have an element that you can uh, price because the EGNs are not uh, uh, inexpensive. So you can say how much you can estimate how much you can save or how much I can invest in implementing IPv6 without having to pay more. And actually, that is what well, there's another thing that I'd, I wanted to discuss uh, more in detail, and it is the issue of an element that is key in the digital transformation and in uh, taking the activities into a virtual world, and that is to create trust. That is to create such a trust among users that they will dare um, work um, uh, in transactions online, payments, banking. And I think that IPv6 plays uh, a, an important role, not too sexy, but it's important that it has to do with the traceability. Uh, sometimes we don't like to talk of this, but it's key. If I can't have actions of anti-abuse, of abuse protection uh, that are precise, then I will, um, the anti-abuse uh, measures will have collateral damage. If I filter an IEP address that is a, actually a carry gray NAT, uh, uh, it's, I'm, I'm uh, uh, removing uh, a thousand users when actually there's only one that is behaving uh, uh, badly. So in the end, this will impair the online trust of users. And this is a message that I think that all the companies, but especially our governments can adopt and think how these things would affect them. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. I loved it personally. I loved uh, that last part uh, of the e-commerce two decades listening about it or maybe more, I think that IPv6 is essential in that respect. So now I see that Nico wants to add something. Nico. Thank you, Alejandro. Precisely, I wanted to speak uh, in line with what Carlos said and uh, answering one of the questions that there are in the chat, in the Q&A. There's a question in the chat asked by Osman regarding remote work and what 
infrastructure of final equipment can be implemented without affecting security insurance incidents. And there's another question regarding regulations during the pandemic regarding IPv6 and other issues that might be critical. And all this linked to what you were saying, Alejandro, on that change in that digital transformation. I think that digital transformation that was a catalyst during the pandemic was something that had not been planned. This was like a shock therapy for the entire humanity. And specifically on this topic we have, we're discussing. And because this had not been planned, this is like an emergency situation. In an emergency situation, you have no time to start testing very new things. So what you do is to apply the protocols that you have already practiced and tested for emergency situations. So when you respond in an emergency situation, you try to have things as automated as possible in order not to make mistakes. So if the ship is sinking and it has a hole, the more holes it has, the faster it sinks. On regulatory issues, in general, regulators try to ease the burden on the users, on the entire management uh, of the state that involve the different systems and mechanisms. So these regulations are like emergency regulations in order to find solutions to problems in the sense of assisting a critical or semi-critical situation. Regarding security, when we start working from home, the rapid response to Osman questions is none. There's no infrastructure, I can think of no infrastructure that I can deploy without involving security issues. In fact, security has become even more important now for users when we stop, start working at home. When I work at an organization, there is an IT team, organizations to a larger or smaller extent have an IT team that is in charge of security issues. They are specialized on these issues, but at home, this does not exist. I don't have an IT team. I am the user, I am the IT team, and security is something that is sort of not so much considered when I start working from home. So there is a need of enhancing capacity building among users in general and also in the organizations. It enhance information about and security. So in my opinion, more campaigns should be organized to educate people on simple issues, not long-term things, but very specific issues to be taken into account regarding how to manage security at home. For example, access to the internet. And after we have seen in this pandemic, this is where most of the activities started taking place, the work and education. So things shifted over to working from the home during the pandemic. So for example, why might a regulator be interested in IPv6, why they might be interested in uh, security for domain names. And there is a motivation. Regulators don't get up one day and say, I'm going to regulate for the sake of regulating. They have to have a motivation and it has to be for the common good. So there are several points that were mentioned in this regard. For example, in the case of IPv6, Carlos mentioned that we have to generate trust. And previously others mentioned, for example, those agencies who work on compliance, for example, the law enforcement and other organizations that work on cybersecurity. So they're interested in having 
traceability in order to be able to investigate certain crimes on cybersecurity issues. So have an operator that uses IPv4 but has not deployed IPv6. They don't use the two protocols, they only use IPv4. And because they have no more addresses available, they use one same public address for many users, then it becomes far more difficult to obtain traceability when the legislation requires this. So there is a clear motivation there to simplify things, to have less boxes in the middle in order to generate more trust and also more security for online users. Regarding other security protocols, for example, applying DNSSEC in the domain name, the motivation is quite clear, at least for me, but maybe not all for everyone. So we want to generate more and more trust among users, for example, regarding access to financial services. So there are many types of attacks to infrastructure, cybersecurity attacks to different internet infrastructures in order to obtain credentials to access uh, bank accounts. So many things can be mitigated or overcome if we apply security protocols. I therefore think that it should be of interest not only of the organizations, but also of the regulators to be able to at least promote best practices and the deployment of these protocols. And we have DNSSEC. There are quite a few. The initial packet to start would be four or five protocols, but this should be promoted more at national level. As, as I said, among the organizations, and why not starting with the government agencies? An additional thing that has to do with all these topics is the following. We have to start approaching this now. We won't be innovating during the emergency. We won't be touching what is already working. But once this is over and we are in the process of overcoming the situation, once the emergency starts to be overcome, the organizations and the regulators should sit down and say, well, what were the lessons learned during the, during the pandemic? What could we have had and what don't we have that could have made our life easier? What would have generated or created greater trust among the users. So let us work on those topics. It's not about saying, well, we have now overcome the emergency and we'll go back to the previous situation. That is not, it's not about that. And it wouldn't be wise to dump all those things that we learned during the pandemic. Thank you, Nicolas for that great recap you made of several topics. Now, before giving the floor to Edwin, I'd like to ask the members of the panel. I think there's a connection issue, sorry. There are two questions we have in the chat. One is from Rafael Ignacio Sandoval, and he says, I'm sorry, there is an issue with the connection. The regulator issued, did the regulator issue a regulation for the ISP regarding digital transformation with IPv6? He spoke about the early adoption by the governments. Could you please expand on this? So you have two minutes, please. I will try to briefly answer your question. The first question from Rafael. Let me say that in Costa Rica, the regulator didn't issue a regulation on this topic. What we do have is in terms of public policies for the development of telecommunications. This is addressed at the ministries and public agencies. And as was mentioned earlier, this, it is more productive to do this first in the public agencies and then to extend this to the private companies. Likewise, in the case 
of la CNIC. I'm trying to look at the question now, he says. So while I access to the third question, one of the questions that came up has to do with the main challenges when changing to IPv6. From the standpoint of the state, we have to create the necessary conditions so that the state agencies can implement this. As we said earlier, we always counted on LACNIC's support in terms of training activities. But I repeat, this has all been an enormous challenge, although this is part of the public policies. It has been a major challenge to manage this implementation throughout the public agencies. And then massive application also involves resources so that the service providers can change the routers at the home. Many operators already have these devices, but some operators haven't done this. He says that he couldn't access the third question. This had to do with training? No, well, I will repeat it. The third one is from LACNIC, asked by Henry Godoy. LACNIC has demonstrated that the collaboration or cooperation is more effective than regulation in the practices of IPv6. Edwin referred to early adoption by the governments. Could you please expand on this? This is in line with collaboration, or would this be forced in terms of the timeline? Well, I think we could do this in, along the two, in the two ways. This was made mandatory for the state. So if we manage to achieve this change in the state, this will then spill over to the rest. So I do believe that there has to be a, a deadline. And in the other area, we have to collaborate with the private companies through training activities and other actions so that this transition can be carried out at the same time. Thank you, Edwin. And I apologize to, um, to hurry you up. Carlos. Edwin started answering a question, but we have a question from Bertin Gallardo, and he states, which are the main challenges when changing over to IPv6? I know this is an enormous question, but you should summarize this in 75 seconds. Thank you, Alejandro, and thank you, Bertin, for the question. Well, this is a question that we have asked ourselves over many years, and the answer has also changed. I will briefly refer to a study carried out by LACNIC that we shared in the May event that has to do with a series of interviews that we conducted with operators of major networks. These are the large members of LACNIC, which in all cases are operators that have millions of users in each case. And we shared this with a similar study, not identical, but a similar one that we carried out in 2006. And the answer we obtained now was different. In the 2006 study, 16 studies, sorry, was a challenge for operators. And this was related with the CPEs, the devices that are in the client's home. home those routers that did not support IPv6 and the ones that exist in IPv6 with IPv in 2016 with IPv6 support were more expensive. So we're speaking about 10 to $50 compared to 30 to 40. Expressed in this way, this might sound too much. If you factor it in, you might have to purchase quite a lot, a million, for example. This was a very big, very, a lot of money. But an issue with the CPEs is that they break down. 
I don't know, the, the lightning strikes, a dog buys it, and the replacement cycle is about two to three years, and then you replace all these CPAs, two, three, or five years. But there is a natural replacement cycle because they eventually break down. So what we interpreted is that in most cases, this replacement has taken place. Tanto es así que cuando hicimos este estudio en 2019-2020, La problemática de los CPS ya no so apareció. The problems of ISPs uh, didn't appear in this uh, as ranking first or second as the greatest challenges that that has been solved. In the case of the operators, the, the challenge that they mention has to do with something that is not so well known is the VSS and OSS that are generic terms that are used for the systems of operational support and for business uh, uh, support systems. So how do you generate uh, business orders? It would be with the OSS and uh, the OSS and how do I bill it? That is the BSS, but it's not because the system has to run in a, a, an equipment with uh, IPv6, but sometimes the verification processes are related to that. Uh, so there's an investment that could be higher or lower to adapt uh, those systems so that they can support IPv6 when the customer needs it. Now, the problem, the difficult problem is that the OSS and the BSS are not products that you go and buy to a vendor, a uh, software vendor, but they are very specific to each operator. So it is difficult to help the, the operator do it. Uh, the good news is that they are doing, as you see in the IPv6 statistics, because today throughout the region, a user, one user out of five already have IPv6 version. So I think that today, as reported by the operators, that is the greatest challenge and additional problem. And I know that I've been talking too long, uh, my apologies, Alejandro, has to do with where do we stand? That it's, this is a sort of a jing and jang uh, raise for the content of access to for the deployment of IPv6. For a long time, the people said, well, the operator said, there's no content, so why should I put IPv6 if they are not going to use it? And that was true for a long time. But then in 2012 and 2013, we had the World uh, uh, IPv6 Day and IPv6 uh, Launch Day, and all of a sudden we started seeing uh, IPv6 contents. Initially, it was um, uh, it trickled a little. Uh, uh, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, and I'm um, leaving somebody out, and all of a sudden there was content. So that had a very clear effect because there we saw the first deployment to Telefonica Peru, and then in the region and then the penetration of IPv6 uh, started growing in the access. And now where do we stand? I think that we have more problems from the side of the content than access. I would say that there's already a very significant amount of access in IPv6 and what we uh, is missing is content. We have to work more on content. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you that the that last part uh, access and content that was very interesting what uh, came first the chicken or the egg now we uh, we don't have much time but victor could you please in a couple of minutes try to predict the future of what you think that the digital transformation will be in the future and i think that after that cesar will uh, have a floor so please the panelists could you put your email addresses in the chat so that the audience may contact you Victor, the future. How do you see the future? Well, I think that uh, somebody in the panel asked uh, how we believe what will happen with 5G, especially with IPv6. I think that is a reality. All the new things that will be created in uh, 5G will be IPv6. I think that today we are, you, we are moving towards a future where the technology will be quite mobile. Although the pandemic changed people's behaviors, the mobile part has grown a lot. And in that line, I think that IPv6 will be key and also to solve the problems that were mentioned by the other panelists, such as security at home. Although there's some people believe falsely that the fact of not having a NAT exposes us more Finally, the I, uh, now they, uh, the routers that we are 
installing bring their own firewalls. And I see that there's more problem not migrating because I've seen companies that have their systems, that have their their machines, such as anyone that uh, they can give a user so that they can have the security systems. The problem is that if they go through NAT, if they don't meet all the requirements of that app or that system, they can't do it. With IPv6, I think that we would be able to do it. So I know that the content today in the measurements is 50% and we saw it in a, an internal analysis that we conducted to specially focus. Uh, we estimate that the content that you can deliver in IPv6 is 80% already. So uh, if you add the cost reduction, I think that uh, it's very understandable that in a very short uh, time, we will migrate massively to work uh, with that platform. Thank you, Victor. That was an excellent summary on the future of IPv6. Uh, a, a loud uh, round of applause to all of you. It was very, very useful. And now I give the floor to Cesar. Thank you. I want to thank the panelists for such an interesting, such interesting presentations, giving all the details. This has been a, it, very clear. The concepts have been very clear, and we saw the perspective of the different uh, players. Thank you, Alejandro, for chairing the panel, number one, and also for also chairing uh, Lee Howard's presentation. So now we go on with the agenda, and we give the floor to the second panel, the panel strategic role of IPv6 uh, looking forward. Uh, um, uh, the pandemic has posed uh, many challenges for the future, where the companies, the governments, our citizens, we, we have required the internet as the key tools for our daily lives. This, so as a consequence, the internet needed to be uh, scalable to make the most of these benefits, but especially for the future, to have a dynamic future for the development of this tool. Deploying IPv6 is essential for those purposes. And in this panel, we try to identify the strategic role of implementing IPv6 uh, moving forward. Um, so we have four panelists, Oscar Robles, our CEO at uh, LACNIC, Bruno Ramos, Regional Director for the Regional Office of the Americas of the ITU, Juan Olmos, uh, Director General of NIC AR, and uh, Wesley Correa, an expert on ISP, businessman and consultant of telecom trainings. So each panelist will give a, a brief presentation and then we'll move to a Q&A session. So without further ado, I give the floor to Oscar. Oscar, thank you. Thank you, Cesar. My greetings to all the colleagues in the panel. So let me share my presentation. I think that this one will be the best. There you are. Are you seeing it? Yes, yes, we see it, Oscar, go ahead. Perfect, thank you. Well, so I'm going to try to expand on the my previous idea. I said that at some time, um, IPv6 was no longer a business decision, not even a technical decision of the operators. For a long time, we thought that this was a decision that depended on uh, the operators that needed to grow or to innovate, but it's no longer the case. So for some time, this is no longer an exclusive reason for deploying IPv6, and now it is an even more essential process, more key to the operators. And of course, this has an impact, not only on governments, but in all the players that participate in this ecosystem. So 
let me tell you um, who we are, who LACNIC is, for those of us who don't have us, us in the raid. Radar. It's the entity responsible for uh, um, administering uh, the internet uh, resources, the IP numbers and the identifiers in the internet. We are an association established in Uruguay, a non-profit uh, international entity with more than 12,000 members in a range of members from uh, large operators, small ISPs, companies, um, universities, etc. So we are one of the five regional registries that play this role. Now, what do we mean when we speak of a numeric resources IP addresses? So basically today, each uh, device is connected to the, that is connected to the internet has um, a numeric ID that is an IP address. For a long time, we use the IPv4 standard, but not always was that the case. IPv4 originated in the end, uh, in the late 70s, but it wasn't uh, used until the 80s. That is, we are about to turn 40 years old before when the internet actually is 50 years old. Initially, they used an older protocol. IPv4 has been used for 40 years, but also in the mid 90s, they defined the new protocol IPv6 that would be the uh, step to the stable internet. It was no longer an internet that had an exponential growth of 1000 per year, year after year. Um, so it, but with a stable growth, uh, so this had to be resilient to the different challenges. So it's IPv6 is here to stay. And this offers us the possibility of connecting not just each internet user. No, not only do we have enough uh, addresses uh, for the internet uh, providers, but also each internet device to connect each uh, internet device. And that is where would I have want to explain. Why is it that IPv6 is so strategic? Well, first of all, because of a very simple thing. In Latin America, we are about from 600 and 700 million people, depending on the source of uh, data or the territories identified. And of these, we have about 400 million internet users in the region of which we have we still have to connect about 240 million uh, to connect uh, everybody or the rest of uh, the people in the region and we only have 200 million ip addresses that have already been allocated uh, have been assigned we have 1 million to be assigned but this million won't be enough to connect the 240 million that uh, people that we still have to connect. Therefore, if the governments have in their agendas, they have projects for technological development involving connecting the uh, uh, people who are not connected and the uh, population said that find it more challenges to connect to the internet, they need to consider the challenge of IPv6. On the contrary, if not, the possibilities to receive a low quality internet, and I'm not speaking of speed, but uh, poor quality, limited, where some apps won't work, where even if you increase the speed of uh, the velocity of access, you, they won't have the, the velocity that they need, so um, with a remunerated space, if they don't have IPv6, they will have all these challenges. So this is the first reason of why uh, IPv6 has become strategic. So why is it that IPv6 is strategic? Because um, if we don't have enough uh, addresses to connect to the 240 million people, 200 million people that we still have to connect, uh, 
then it's going to be even more difficult to have enough addresses to connect the devices that will that we try to connect uh, in future years. Y todos estos conceptos de smart cities, eh, industria 4.0, of things in smart cities, 4.0 industry, smartphones, and the possibility of having deployment of solutions for traffic, for mobility, and for natural resources and pollution require a large amount of sensors that already have the capacity of having an IP identifier. So the IP this is what we call the IP stack. This is a small computer which can not only tap at the environment and the temperature and the light and other factors, but also have an IP stack. Maybe today the sensors are far simpler. And more and more, the more sophisticated sensors the more complex ones have that capacity. So all these resources have to have sufficient uh, amount of IP addresses. So some time ago, listening to C.D. Howard, we don't have sufficient addresses, even if they uh, purchased in the secondary market. So the likelihood is that they won't be sufficient addresses to connect each of the sensors and devices that participate in these solutions. For example, the cameras and the temperature sensors, movement, uh, cars driving. So internet requires the trust from the users. The users have to have a feeling of trust, of security, and internet allows to have traceability of transactions to a certain extent and allows operators to map an IP address with a subscriber's group. So this traceability is strongly affected with IPv6. And if uh, offense or crime takes place, it is essential for the security of internet to generate trust in the event of such crimes. And this is for a reduced group. With IPv4, you cannot map a small group of users. When something happens in the internet, the operators do not have the capacity to identify which group of subscribers, uh, the reduced number of subscribers carried out such a transaction. So we'll get a list of 200, 500, 1,000 possible connections that took place at that very same instant and used the same IPv4 address. So crimes that are carried out through the internet can be seriously limited. It can seriously limit the investigation and solution in these cases. So we have these three elements here, these three aspects, which I wanted to talk about today regarding what makes IPv6 something strategic, the possibility of connecting to all the devices that we can connect to deploy those solutions that make society better, the possibility to connect more people, and also to deliver a more secure and reliable internet to the users. So how do we stand in the region with IPv6 if this is strategic? Why haven't we taken that step in the region? Carlos was explaining a while ago some of the reasons why this deployment has not been carried out in the region. But we also have good news together with a call for action. Now, the good news is that in the region we have 25% deployment, as Lee Howard told us this morning, for accessing IPv6. Now, as happens with averages, it happens that some have very little and many, some have a lot of this measurement. In the case of Mexico, Brazil, and Uruguay, these are the countries that have the highest 
penetration and deployment of IPv6 in the region. And other countries are be far behind. So we have to try to make other countries deploy IPv6 to a similar level. Now, how can we assist from each of our organizations to make this a reality? We can all do something. As I was saying, one of the ways of making these efforts is through cooperation with the different organizations involved in this ecosystem. This is not something that only involves operators. This is not only the responsibility of those involved in the business, in the different areas, they will be they will benefit from this. But we have benefits for all. As you can see from this table on the top right, the ISPs are those that are most benefited by this IPv6 deployment because they are the ones who carry out this business. But we do have other stakeholders such as universities and users, the governments who also benefit from the deployment of IPv6 of this adequate or faster deployment of IPv6. As an example, what can governments do to speed up this deployment? As we saw in the previous chart, there are a series of benefits that have to do with the deployment of IPv6. Now, let us see how the state, how the governments, how the regulators can collaborate, how the telecommunications sector can favor this deployment. We have two ways. One is traditional regulation, which always is a mechanism. And of course, the state has the right and the liberty to do so and can apply it whenever they wish. But on the other hand, we have cooperation. We have seen in the region that the regulatory processes are less effective compared to the collaborative processes. This is because in the collaboration processes, the atmosphere is different. It is not a call to regulate. Therefore, there is an aspirational response as to what will be done to, to deploy IPv6. And this serves as a motivation to awaken and take actions to deploy IPv6 in the networks. On the other hand, regulations initially triggers a rejection. Most operators might say, well, what will we receive in exchange from the state to speed up the IPv6 deployment? If you wish to have it for a given date, what will we receive in exchange? And if the state does not have resources, well, I will then just establish a legal obstacle because this also costs resources. But sooner or later, the operators will have to implement this. And if they don't do so, they are not conducting the adequate analysis. But ultimately, they will establish these legal recourse, will prevent them from advancing, will generate friction between regulators and operators, and we will only have excuses. They will be speaking with lawyers, with those, and not with those responsible for services and the network. And this measure will not necessarily be effective. On the other hand, the collaborative processes can bring together several stakeholders. It's not only those who are regulated, it can bring together the academia, the users, the different trade organizations, the ICTs. This can lead to a far more effective, organized and inclusive deployment and also a speedier deployment. So this is a summary that I wanted to share with you. There are many things that states can carry out. I have some ideas, for example, to promote the fact that operators retain the capacity of mapping each IP to a subscriber or to a reduced number of subscribers, to be more specific. And this obviously is an indirect measure to prevent the use of CGNs, of carrier grade NATs. So basically, this promotes the deployment of IPv6. This not only contributes to the deployment of IPv6 for these issues, but also there are some 
entities in the state that are favored by this, for example, the legal sector regarding traceability of transaction in the case of certain crimes. This, of course, involves different types of measures of the impact this has. These can be applied internally in the government agencies and can also be done for the licensees or the operators and can also be implemented at national level, some with certain limitations. In some cases, we suggest not to do so. But nevertheless, there is a likelihood that the state can do something in order to promote the effective deployment. So that is what I wanted to share with you. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Oscar, for your presentation. I'd like to remind the participants that you can write your question in the Q&A box. And we will be then collecting all the questions. And at the end of the presentations, we'll have a Q&A round for the experts. We now give the floor to Bruno Ramos, who is the director of the Office for the Americas of the ITU, and he will be making a presentation on the strategic role of IPv6 in the ecosystem of the internet. Bruno, you have the floor. We cannot hear you, Bruno. Can you hear me, Cesar? Yes, we can hear you now. I apologize for this, but I'm using two computers, and I was looking at the settings in the computer. Cesar, my greetings. Good afternoon to you. It's great to be here with you, and my greetings to my friends who are part of this panel. Thank you very much for the invitation. I will have like a conversation with you on the points that we have been discussing this morning. I will try to also bring in some other ideas. The light here has been turned off. Now, let's see. I think that in terms of what we have been listening this morning, I agree with the points expressed by Oscar regarding the importance of connectivity for people and also those points related to regulation. I would like to look at some of the wider aspects of the internet applications. I will start speaking about the sustainable development goals. At the ITU, we are involved with the task of assisting the United Nations members on the implementation of the sustainable development goals of the 2030 agenda. If we look back some years, these goals were signed in 2015. So if we look at 2016 and 2017, the ICTs was very clear regarding two objectives. Now, after the 2020 pandemic, we have seen that all the governments started to include in the planning the relevance of the ICTs to support the activities of all the countries. So not only the implementation of the SDGs is in, has been in the agenda since 2015, but after the COVID pandemic, 
The inclusion of ICTs was included to support all the economic aspects of the countries. So we always have had at the ITU and the development area, the concept of helping countries in Latin America regarding infrastructure problems. But we now are seeing the relevance this has for all the governments in the region regarding planning the transformation and the re economic recovery of the country. So this is not only about access, which is one of the most important things that we have to face, one of the major challenges we have to face regarding infrastructure in the region. But more and more, we also see that in terms of digital transformation, governments have been including this in their agendas. Therefore, how is this related to the deployment of IPv6 networks? We see more and more that in the work of the ITU and in the standardization where we have the discussions related to the new IoT networks and the 5G networks, we have seen that in these discussions, we are increasingly trying to have decisions or recommendations that are not related to technologies at the ITU. We try to focus on these things too. But we have seen that the 5G networks and other networks, in that sense, we don't have the possibility of not having resources to provide capacity for developing networks for the new technologies. Therefore, what are governments doing regarding this agenda, regarding implementation of IT as a basis for economic recovery? Technical discussions on resources, resources should not be an obstacle for the implementation of these networks. So it is there that I would like to make a first reflection. It is impossible not to have the development of these networks as a priority. The new generation networks, the new technologies, in the short term and in the medium term, have to be considered in the sense of providing the governments with the capacities to support this implementation. For people, because ultimately we have beyond the technical issues, we have to consider how people will be using these technologies after the pandemic, connectivity and access to applications and even and the e-government applications, all these things are now a priority. We therefore have to think in a collaborative manner. We have to connect people but we also have to provide access to new applications. These applications should have to access IPv through IPv6 addresses. Additionally, we have to really assist people to understand the changes arising from these new situations. As part of the work of the ITU, we have radio standardization and development. In the development sector where the ITU offices are located, we work a lot on capacity building. 
this as the top of the list of the activities we carry out. We have signed agreement with agreements with governments in order to work on training plans that are custom made for the different governments and for the technical experts in order to implement e-government plans. And the technical experts from the government should have the capacity of being aware of which are the problems and the solutions that are specific for the different countries. One of the examples of these courses is one that we are organizing at the ITU Academy. This is related to IoT and 4.0 industry. We have organized courses for several countries regarding IoT architecture and the eco IoT ecosystem. And also an important thing on IPv6 or 5G networks. Now, what is the purpose of these activities? namely to make the public agencies and agents should understand the capacity these tools have for collecting data and so that public policies are not an obstacle to the development of each country. I have touched upon some of the topics in order to focus our work as experts on ICTs to focus on people. How can we develop these things? How can we use ICTs for the economic development of the different countries? I think solutions will always come up in the understanding that the ICT sector is a national priority for the different countries. Any type of innovation is of utmost importance for the countries. We cannot sit down and wait for the development of the 5G networks and then realize that we don't have 4G networks in all the cities of the countries of the country. We have to think that the new technologies will provide new knowledge. The governments, from the strategic standpoint, have to enable all this deployment. To finish, let's, we have to think how we'll be doing this. Since 2010, we have had strong discussions on the role of the different international organizations. Today, it is quite clear that collaborative, uh, the collaborative approach is of utmost importance in order to work towards the development of the internet as a priority. It is a priority to have collaborative work with the expertise of every agency. And in my discussions with the governments, I have noted that all those governments that have started to work on digital planning for the future are aware of some of the organizations, our role, therefore, for example, through this event that has been organized today, will raise the awareness of the importance of the development of the ICTs, the governments can then have a more holistic view of the different tasks we carried out at the ITU. We work in the standardization of the new recommendations for the development of the new networks. We have a development department which is strongly focused on training and capacity building. We provide custom made courses for the different countries on new technologies, on capacity building, always seeking to focus on the new applications that will be providing these new technologies. 
the work of the ITU with the strategic partners of the region is part of the work we're carrying out. We have specific projects with different countries, for example, for capacity building on cybersecurity in some of the countries, work with community networks involving access and new applications for others. A lot of work is being done in digital inclusion, capacity building for people. So the point of this discussion of migration to IPv6 is that this is a situation that is taking place, it will take place, and we have to help countries understand this situation and how we can assist in this task. Cesar, this is what I wanted to share with you. And when we come to Q&A, we can have an interaction on the role of each institution and agency and how we can contribute more. Thank you, Bruno, for your works and for describing the path that is being taken by the ITU on issues related to ICTs. We'll be able to discuss the main role of the different sectors in order to drive the development of IPv6 as a strategic element. We'll now give the floor to Juan Olmos. Juan is the Director General of the IT Systems of NIC AR. He will be telling us about the role played by NIC AR regarding the deployment of IPv6. Juan, you have the floor. Thank you, Cesar. I will briefly tell you what we have been working on and the current context regarding the implementation of IPv6. It is quite clear that the networks are a key component in the development of any community, both from the standpoint of digital inclusion and of bringing value services to the citizens and a greater opportunity for interaction and connection. So as to achieve the final objective of improving the quality of the of life of the citizens. So this development should not be limited by things such as the scarcity of IPv4 addresses, although NAT is an option, it is not an in-depth solution considering the technical features and the complexities of the architecture, degradation of services and loss of traceability, particularly for issues, particularly for fighting against cybercrime. We started this task at the end of 2019. We had initial talks with the main stakeholders, particularly with the state of Argentina involved in this task, mainly with the Deputy Secretariat on Technologies and Telecommunications. And we from NIC Argentina. Unfortunately, not a month had gone by since we had the first meetings that uh, the pandemic uh, was on was and uh, so with that change the priorities and the agendas of all of us today we are resuming uh, these talks and the idea is to continue to work at this uh, we are already we've we've already uh, started the dialogue with lacnic and with other stakeholders especially of the public and the academic sectors, because this is an issue that although the governments seem to be the drivers 
of this transformation that we need to do, this is impossible unless all the stakeholders get engaged. So we are establishing a, a, an agenda and in the near future, I'm sure that you'll have news about the various activities and the meetings that we will hold just to give you the context. Thank you. Thank you, Juan, for your comments. Now I'd like to uh, recognize Wesley Correa. Wesley has been with us in many events of LACNIC and he is knowledgeable about IPv6. So we'd like to see your presentation, Wesley. Go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar. I'm going to share my presentation. I prepared something for you to present. Well, so we're going to talk a bit about the strategic uh, uh, issue of uh, uh, IPv6 in the future. Um, here I have a, a talk, but as this is recorded, you can uh, then uh, hear the, the story. You can read it later. And let's see why uh, IPv6 will be important in the future of the internet. And we've seen this exponentially this last year, how relevant the connectivity and telecommunications are and communications uh, proper and the relevance of uh, the internet uh, grew because of the pandemic. Many people who were not connected felt the need to be connected either because they had to telework or because the need to keep their business running. Maybe some uh, uh, businesses that were not selling online, they had to connect um, to continue to work. So we've seen that this last year, the connectivity of uh, new users in the internet has uh, grown exponentially. And why did that happen? Well, precisely because the internet was the only means of communication and for some people to work. And even we could even say that people needed the internet to survive. So let's share some numbers of we are social. Uh, about the uh, standards of the growth of the internet, just evaluating this last year. And then we'll check whether it's really important to have IPv6 for us to continue to grow. There we have the first image that talks about the number of internet users in, uh, the, in total. Today we are speaking of more than 4 billion people, that is, about 60% of the global population. We've seen that there's a range of stakeholders in the internet globally. We have ISIC, we have the RIRs, the NIRs, the different agencies or organizations that work. They always work for us to have as many people connected to the internet as possible because that will make life easier for people. In the past, in order for you, for instance, to take a postgraduate course, it, you had, you just had to go there 100%. But uh, a master's degree today can be done almost uh, fully online and a lot of resources and information can be found in the internet. And the more connected people, the more people will be sharing information and we're going to have more people making use of uh, that information that is available in the internet. So there, they, they uh, show the growth between January 2020 and January 2021. That is the year of the pandemic. This the, was called the digital year, the year of the pandemic we, we had 360 million additional users in the internet globally, and that is 7.3%. Uh, it might not sound much as a percentage, but in absolute numbers, 360 million people are a lot, a lot of users, and that makes the difference in a platform 
in a, an internet that was not ready for so many users, uh, as we, uh, uh, we heard Oscar. And we've seen that the IPv4 addresses available are not capable, they cannot uh, direct uh, the, the, they cannot route the users and or the devices because today a user has at least a smartphone and a smart TV, a computer, and many other things. So this number of users is reflected in many, many more devices connected. So in that other image there, you see that over 90% of internet users do it through smartphones. And that, of course, promotes other technologies as uh, was very well said by other, uh, the IUT. And IUT is here to stay and it's going to be part, the IOT is going to be part of our lives, either because of the sensors, temperature sensors, uh, uh, gas oximeters, or because the refrigerator sends a uh, note to your smartphone saying that, uh, you need uh, milk for tomorrow, for children's breakfast. So we are connected and there's no way back. We need to connect uh, even further. And this 90% that use mobile technologies are users that are certainly in the near future, very few years are going to be users of uh, IOT and sensors at homes or in a car where you um, uh, plug uh, the phone and they know or any kind of notifications that is uh, tethered to this uh, will be part of our lives. And that, of course, for that you need, we need to deploy IPv6 further. And there you have an additional, uh, there you have a map with a percent uh, of internet users in the different parts of the world. And there you see in the image that the American continent, that is uh, North America, Central America, and South America account for many, many users. We have, for instance, Eastern Asia, the largest uh, technology manufacturers because they assemble products and create new technologies, they have, don't have so many users as uh, South America or North America. So we are, um, so we believe that in the future, we'll reach uh, more than 80 and even 100% of the people connected. But for that, what do we need? Is it that without IPv4 available, just using resources like Caragray NAT uh, or uh, other resources to reuse IP addresses. Is it possible to reach 70 to 80, 100% of the people connected? That's impossible because as was very well pointed out by the rest of the speakers, we need traceability, we need uh, uh, quality and especially in, well, in the, some in a home office, some VPN, don't work on that. That is, there's, we need a, a public IPv4 or have availability to IPv6. And we are working, we are heading toward a world where everything is adjusted based on the number of people living in the, that country. For instance, we see that the increase of a uh, population um, uh, ha has an impact on uh, the production of food and uh, all the sort of things. And as Oscar pointed out here in Paraguay, I live in Paraguay, Paraguay, Brazil, other countries too that are uh, producers of uh, large scale producers of food. There's a technology that is known by almost all the uh, uh, farmers, I'm not speaking of people with master's degree, none of those, uh, none. It's agriculture, it's precision agriculture. And precision agriculture means producing more in the same space. And what 
is it that these uh, farmers are using? They're using technology and the more technology, the more IoT, the more sensors, for instance, that measure the moisture in the soil, the pH, they're going to see where you need to spray, where you need to irrigate, where you need um, to add uh, some fertilizer for the earth uh, to produce more. And that is what people are using because uh, we have more and more people on this planet. And every day we have more people to feed and the the planet continues to be the same. So, for instance, uh, a felling, uh, the massive felling of trees is not no longer an option. That is, we need to produce more with no deforestation, without uh, felling any more trees. What do we need for that? Well, we need IPv6. There's no way you can produce and maintain billions of sensors spread across the world, monitoring everything that's missing and uh, applying the inputs where you need to produce more so that we can uh, have a better quality of life. You really, it's absolutely necessary to have IPv6 and IoT technology. So that is why it's absolutely essential for us to continue to deploy IPv6. And we, we need to continue to understand that it is essential for our future. Thank you, Wesley, for your presentation. That was very interesting to see how we can use our technology with the deployment of IPv6. Uh, um, and um, there might be questions by the participants in that regard. So in the meantime, I'm going to give you to ask some questions that I have here as icebreaker, as Alejandro pointed out. I, I'd like to ask Oscar, well, seeing that uh, the digital transformation processes in the region have been a bit in a hurry and given uh, the depletion of IPv4 that is real and today has an impact on the networks, the question is what would you recommend to the governments that are uh, in the digital transformation process uh, for the moving, uh, looking, uh, how should they uh, handle traceability and to include uh, the people who are not connected? Thank you, Cesar. Well, what I said at the end of my presentation was precisely to have that uh, partnership approach. We believe that. Uh, it, the greatest impact is obtained by sitting together with uh, all uh, the stakeholders, of course, the operators who need to do the most relevant things, but not to neglect the universities, the access uh, providers, associations, small uh, um, uh, players and the users, of course, because they have something to say at the university, for instance, the university plays a key role because there are not enough consultants, experts for the deployment of these technologies, of these networks. So it is also very important to start developing those uh, experts locally and not to have to depend on a few international consultants that are going to be able to do the work. But the ideal thing would be for the countries to promote that development and the universities have played that dual role that is on uh, deploying their own ipv6 infrastructure they will have not just uh, meet their uh, requirements of uh, technological innovation but they're also going to start educating cadres of experts in the matter and uh, with that they can give outreach courses to favor that uh, deployment in the country. So the message here for governments is 
uh, approach the different stakeholders, promote that exchange in, in a partnership, uh, because that uh, has a greatest impact than a regulatory process. Of course, the regulatory part is always an option, but what we bring is what we have seen is that uh, has been more successful or with the greatest impact and with a more collaborative uh, dynamics when people sit to talk. Now, the regulatory process uh, generates these frictions between uh, regulators and regulees, and uh, you need a lot of investment, not just in time, effort, resources, and we have seen that no, no other place can be involved because as they are not regulated, they are left out of uh, the conversation. So it's an it, an endless discussion between regulator and, and uh, 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 regulees when it could be much more enriching and uh, much more productive if we uh, put everybody together. Another important thing that we haven't mentioned is that these experiences establish the mechanisms to deal with any other challenges, cybersecurity, for example, Internet of Things, we can speak of the deployment or any other technology of any other technology that comes to your mind. These mechanisms are very helpful because you seat all the different sectors around the table, which balance things out with the different interests each have their own specific interests, so you have a more leveled playing field. That's the suggestion. Thank you, Oscar. Along those lines, and because you stated that the academia plays an important role, particularly in terms of capacity building, Bruno stated that the ITU is making efforts for capacity building with a view to the sustainable development goals. Bruno, do you think that the ITU should reinforce this yet further, reinforcing capacity building because there is a big demand and to recognize this, this not only from the governments, but also from the several stakeholders of the internet ecosystem. What standpoint does the ITU have regarding capacity building? Thank you, Cesar. I will try. Well, there are three points that I would like to state. If we follow this event from session one to session two, we are all advancing in the same direction. We're all speaking about collaboration. We're speaking about new technologies. We're speaking about looking or trying to organize with the operators and the member countries, the development of new technologies, and how these new technologies can provide the necessary resources. That's on one hand. The second point is that as a person responsible for ITU in the region, I have also the responsibility of coordinating with the governments and the specialized UN agencies the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. This is an overarching goal of trying to live in a more sustainable world for all, namely including everyone fighting against hunger and poverty. That's part of my task. And in my role, I have a very clear task in the ICT world. We are somehow experts, we know about the needs, but for me, it is quite clear through the conversations that I'm having that the other sectors don't know very much about the work we carry out. So we can no longer think that the telecommunications 
communications sector that the ICTs will be there and that will be providing our expertise. But we also have to be active in areas such as health, transport, energy with people who don't know everything about the telecommunications sector. They don't even know what IPv6 is. So, and the third part is training. But regarding this second point, we have to consider that this collaborative work is not only among ourselves, but we have to try and find, we have to try and think together with other stakeholders from the economic area, from the social sector, what we can contribute. And the work I have with other specialized agencies of the United Nations, with UNESCO, with the World Health Organization. So telecommunications is there as one of the most important sectors. And the second point I wanted to mention is about that. We have to train all the others to think that there are needs for the telecommunications sectors and the ICT sector, and that we can help in that development. We can say in the health sector, in telemedicine, you have to think about applications that will require new resources and we can collaborate with you in the discussion of the necessary public policies for this development, transport, energy. We're going to have probes in all the homes. And I'm aware of countries that are planning all these things without speaking with the telecommunications sector. They think they will have another network for connectivity, but we already have connectivity. In the chat, I wrote that the vision of the ITU is to train the government agencies. We have to provide tools so that not only the ICT sector, but all the other sectors have to have the visibility showing that there are, there are agencies that can assist in the development of public policies with strategies for the future. So when we think about courses on new technologies, about 5G, on security, on the strategies and migration, we also have to think about capacity building so that each country can understand what is happening in the ICT field and this so that they can contact us so that we can assist them. I think a lot has been done over the past 10 years in the ICT area. We are collaborating far more compared to 2010. Today, we speak about collaboration in order to develop a wider internet, a more inclusive internet, which is better for everyone. We also have to think about training all the other sectors so that they can use our expertise for developing plans for the future. And to close, Cesar, at the ITU, in the ITU Academy, we provide a lot of courses but we are specifically thinking about entre los sectores how we, we can have collaborative regulation between the different economic sectors. Thank you, Bruno, for your comments. I have two questions in the chat. Let's look at the first one. The first question is from Randall Barnett, and he's asking us the following. Precision agriculture requires data acquisition 
analysis, online monitoring, and decision making. The connection speed is essential. Therefore, 5G and IPv6 are of fundamental importance. What would be the recommendation at the level of public policies to make this possible? Who would like to answer this question? Wesley? That's a great question. Now, the interesting thing is that, particularly in data acquisition, speed, yes, but transmission rate, not so high, but speed is very important. I think that the governments will take that into account when they start seeing that agricultural production is important, particularly for local subsistence of the population and also for all the other countries, particularly those countries that export agricultural products. This generates income, taxes, tariffs, etc. So when we start to cast a view with a strategic approach, the governments and the public agencies can understand that if they do something in the sense of facilitating access to these technologies or to provide funding or capacity building so that these people can use these technologies to deploy these things, this will facilitate and increase production. Therefore, this will be directly reflected in the government income in terms of taxes and tariffs, export tariffs and so on. So it's not about imposing this, but it's about cooperating. If you have cooperation, you provide support and assistance. I think this could be developed in a fast, much easier way than what we imagine. Thank you, Wesley, for your answer. I have more questions. A question from Carlos. Is there some kind of coordination between the agencies that manage internet resources, for example, LACNIC, ITU, and the vendors of ICT equipments in order to converge in the migration or implementation towards IPv6 when marketing the devices to the ISPs? Oscar, yes. Particularly with the ITU, we have had this collaboration. We have had this for quite a long time now. Specifically, we have approached some of the governments in the region. Evidently, there are places where we have focused more on, like in the Central American and Caribbean region, some parts of the Caribbean, in order to implement the awareness of these efforts. This is not only for government agencies, but also for operators. We have spoken with operators, with some entities related to ICTs or to the internet in order to highlight the relevance of this topic. And as managers of this resource, these resources and the database, we don't go beyond that. We try to take this information to them. We provide training activities to all the members and to the rest of the extended community of the region in order to favor this deployment. Now, we have to bear in mind that it is the operators, basically, who have to realize how important this is for their business, how important this deployment is for their business. So for some time now, we have organized presentations such as that of Lee Howard, which is more focused on the business model and the profitability or the lack of profitability resulting from this implementation and how this affects the uh, the companies, for example, not implementing IPv4, because this has to do with all these devices, with all these costs and transactions that cannot generate the service to their clients. 
eternamente de que siempre los matan. Those who play video games and are continuously complaining about these things. So all these challenges from the standpoint of the business is what we try to convey. But the final decision depends on the operator. So there are two options. Either they're not including all the variables in the, in the equation or that equation that involves business soundness has not did provided the need to deploy IPv6. So that is something that will arrive sooner or later. So once this reaches all the operators in the region, we hope this will not be too late. Because as Lee Howard explained, the prices in the secondary market, not the ones that we manage for our members, and this has nothing to do with those prices, but what is available in the secondary market starts to increase excessively. And like Lee Howard was saying, today, the majority of the major operators have already made these efforts. And those who still have to make the effort of deploying IPv6 are the smaller operators, not the small ISPs. The small ISPs have already done so. And some of them are more ready than the bigger operators. But things are the small operators of infrastructure who have not done this deployment, and this will be more expensive for them because they arrive at a somewhat later stage. And sooner or later, they will have to do so. Thank you, Oscar. Bruno, si puede esto plasmar en el chat sus contribuciones en inglés. Uh, Bruno is asked uh, whether he can uh, put uh, this in English. I imagine it's the response. I have a comment by Tim Gallardo, who says, Bertin Gallardo, he says, in my view, I consider that if currently it's being hard to implement IPv6, uh, transforming digitally the public and private institutions in agricultural or rural areas, there are challenges to reduce the digital divide in terms of infrastructure, public policies, and costs. I have a question by Aristides Huete that says as follows, what kind of recommendation have you given those countries where you've had a great demand for the internet? Uh, I mean, uh, the change uh, uh, in 2020. And as uh, Aristides said, uh, during uh, the pandemic uh, this, this year, the uh, this has increased. So what has happened in the countries with a great uh, internal domestic demand? I don't know who uh, can answer, Wesley. Although some of these countries may not have such an infrastructure for the internet, many of them have a good mobile telephone infrastructure. And it's what I showed, for instance, what I shared with you, for instance, finding you may have some interesting data. In Paraguay, 102% of the people have at least one SIM card, a, a mobile chip and a mobile phone. So even though the country may not have a very significant fiber optic infrastructure backbones, they will have telecom. And I think that this will be the most efficient way forward um, so that we can reach 100% of the people. And there, for instance, you have India, where a new operator, relatively new, five or six years old, started 100% with IPv6, offering very inexpensive plans. And they uh, had many, many users in a very short time. That shows that mobile technologies are the easiest uh, to, if you want to reach the people that you want to reach, that is the people that don't have much money to buy a computer, but they do have the money for a smartphone and they can uh, log in and connect to the to the network. So with these uh, radio bases and those towers that uh, provide services to those regions, uh, either 
uh, or villages or whatever, in those towers, we with those towers, we'll be able to extend both uh, 5G, the Internet of Things, or IPv6. I think that that will be more or less the way forward, and I have even uh, uh, I have trained many who is that uh, are no longer using antennas and they are using fiber optics for the users. And they asked me, should I uh, tear down the towers? And I say, no, don't. Essentially, because the mobile internet has reached 90% of the users. So 90% of the people that use the internet, you do it through their mobile phones. So disassembling the towers is going against the current. So don't do that. Don't tear them down, but create or, uh, or use technologies, there are many available today, to use the infrastructure that already exists so to to increase the connectivity of people thank you thank you wesley Thank you, Wesley, for your participation. I don't know whether with this we can conclude the panel. It's been interesting, very interesting and uh, uh, very enriching to hear you. We have shared uh, some different points of view from different and different elements of the uh, internet ecosystem. I want to thank the members of the panel, Oscar, Bruno, Wesley, uh, Juan Olmos uh, for the participation in this session. So now let me draw some conclusions. But of course, uh, first I want to thank the Inter-American, uh, well, the CITEL, Oh, yes, for organizing jointly with La this webinar jointly with LACNIC. This webinar is being recorded and later on you can revisit it in the in uh, LACNIC's website. As a conclusion, we'd like to point out a couple of key issues. The concept of digital transformation is not new. It's something that in our region and globally, it's be, it has been debated for many years. We've seen the developments uh, in some cases uh, with a good time ahead, but in the last year, we have seen that people had to rush because of the pandemic, and we are all familiar with that. So these developments have a uh, uh, meant some challenges, especially in capacity building and uh, in paying attention to the internet critical issues. We had a keynote speaker, Lee Howard, who gave to, who highlighted the importance of implementing IPv6. He showed that uh, the uptake statistics and the costs of not using IPv6. Others as well pointed out uh, well, that it's not part of a LACNIC, but it's um, the market that's driving this because of the depletion of IPv4. And Lee Howard shared some advantages and, and uh, key characteristics for the use of IPv6, security, traceability, among others. We had a first uh, panel with experts where they shared uh, experiences on the critical resources, access networks, and they highlighted that the support measures to the users were essential for the development of a digital transformation, strengthening networks, was repeated more than once by the speakers in the panel. They, they stressed uh, that it's a well-known fact that 
the internet uh, net, uh, has to be kept uh, using so that it, that everybody may have a good quality internet. We had a presentation by Carlos Martinez, who documents that um, uh, reducing the latencies were, and we can provide continuity to service now and in the future, of course. He also pointed out that IPv6 plays a key role within the process. And so is uh, users trust who are aware of the critical role of uh, trace, the importance of traceability among others. In the second panel, we heard Oscar Robles, who basically discussed uh, the key reasons for IPv6 as a strategic issue, connecting the unconnected. Here we have about 240 million people in the region to that uh, are not connected. So given IPv4 uh, depletion, this is a huge challenge for all of us. We also discussed scale scalability moving forward. Then the new services, apps, that uh, already lead us to connect the people that are, well, and uh, finally preserving digital security of our users and especially highlighting transactions. Uh, from governments, it is uh, timely to promote IPv6 uh, in uh, government uh, um, initiatives, and it is important to involve the decision makers, highlighting the importance of supporting IPv6 in their e-government uh, development. The ITU discussed uh, the future of the internet networks based on the SDGs. There are some that uh, are cross-sectional in the different disciplines. So we need to know the importance of uh, capacity building on ICTs to achieve those objectives and to uh, to meet the goals and uh, to involve governments. Um, the uh, Nick Argentina they talk, talked about the importance of uh, collaborating. Although Argentina has a positive experience in uh, collaboration for deploying IPv6. Um, it has been impaired this last year because of the pandemic, but the conversations have been resuming. And finally, Wesley told us, gave us the technological view moving forward. And uh, especially with IPv6, this is uh, an essential thing for the scalability and the future of the internet. So that's what I had to say. These are our conclusions. If you have any comment, any questions, we ask you to please send them to training at uh, laknik.net. So 